multiply that by two for marketing. Uh, right. It has made so far eight hundred and sixty-six oh million dollars God. in the box office. So it has already exceeded doubling its money. Oh my God. Do you think everyone was just like, fuck it, I'm going to see Aquaman? Well, it's weird because uh, the Spider Man movie, Enter the Spider Verse, uh, came out and that's getting rave reviews. Comic book fans and just like casual movie fans are both loving right. it. People love that movie. That's not doing nearly as well in the box office as this one. Um, oh, you don't say. How much money did that make? Uh, $2 now. And I, it's definitely made its money back. It's doing pretty good. Uh, well,. Superheroes are here to last. Yes. Uh, unlike puppetry. Unlike puppetry? You know, you really want to jump into the movie, but... Um, I don't. Oh, you don't? Okay. I just... You want a magic jump into the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you want to smack that baby and make it bleed. Make it bleed? I thought it was, <laughs> I thought it was make it pee. Max, we discussed this. It's making it bleed. Yeah, I guess you could do both at the same time. Um, if you smack them hard enough, is it make it screech? No. Um, is it make it? No, it's make it freak, right? Make it freak. Yes, make it freak. Like this was this was the eighties, so it's like freak, like you freaking like dancing. MC Hammer. Like yeah, you're dancing. Um, or is it make it Todd Browning free? Oh, I don't. Know. I don't know. Maybe I, our listeners do, because today... Maybe we were fucking smacked as children. That's yeah. why our jokes are so bad. Probably. <laughs> and also as children, I think we both watched today's movie, Jim Henson's wonderful film, Labyrinth. Yay! Welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Max, he's Austin, and we're doing this And I'm movie. Austin, too. <laughs> I don't know about that other guy. I've never seen him before. But yeah, Labyrinth today. But before we start, I need to... I just... I wanted to do this on air because I think you would laugh. I thought you would laugh really loudly um, or just be frightened, <laughs> in which case I'd laugh. But anyway, I, uh, I, I wanted to reveal some of the things I got for Christmas, specifically one thing. Oh, and God. I just, first of all, you said you got socks for Christmas. I was so excited. Somebody shared like this. Socks are good. This line graph of like your age versus how excited you are to get socks for Christmas. And it is very true because... I mean, as an adult with an income, you're just like things that you would like put on a wish list as a kid. It was like, oh, I hope I get this. Like you just sort of get them when they come out when you're an adult. And then like Christmas, you're like, what do I need? It's like, oh, I've forgotten to, you know, buy yeah. myself new It's like you clothes. always need socks. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, that was my, I also, I got a, I also got socks. I got a, a gift, a gift, two gift cards. One to Target so I can buy Ooh. shit for my new apartment. Oh, hell yeah. And one for the archive so I can buy movies. So that's oh, fun. awesome. Yeah, so that's perfect. That's the extent of my they exciting have gift Christmas. cards, huh? Yeah. Huh. They, they used to, <laughs> they had these gift cards for a while now. They used to just be pieces of paper with like gift card written on it <laughs> and signed by one of the store members. Now they're actual like plastic cards. Oh, uh, they should have kept that. Yeah. Or they should make the plastic card that. But anyway, I, he, here's what I want to do, okay? So I want you to like either like, turn a face away from me or close your eyes or something. And I want to know, I want to know if you can guess what this is just by when I like turn it on into the microphone. I'm terrified. The gift from my insane Austin, family. I'm, uh, audience. I'm sorry. I didn't agree to this. So <laughs> I, uh, I don't even remember what my response was when, when I got this, but I just, it I want has you... a very strong packaging smell. I don't know. I can't see it yet though. All right. Just, just, Hopefully this is not too loud. Maybe uh, okay. I'm gonna take the headphones off, but but just listen. You know what that is? No, I. Oh, is that a little? We have a movie thing. We have the the thing. No, it's not. It's <laughs> why do you have a taser? <laughs> ah! It's not a taser. It's a stun gun. But uh, same thing. I don't get that fucking away from me. I don't trust you with that. We're going to have a lull in the show and you're going to fucking tase me to <laughs> keep us going. Uh, <laughs> Why do you have that? Shh, quiet. Quiet, jeez. What you're could you possibly need that for? Wake the neighbors and they're going to good take our taser. Good. You don't deserve to have that. Well, uh, did I explain that my family is... Uh, well, hopefully they're not listening to the show because then they might come and tase me. But, 
but uh, I, needless to say, I didn't ask for that. I'm sure I'll find a way to use it some at at some point. So uh, it'll be a good movie prop at some point. Yeah, 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 yeah perfect. Yes, and uh, you know, I, I I don't know any better way to to begin like an enthralling conversation of Aquaman than than tasing me <laughs> for talking about Aquaman. <laughs> I guess. Uh, but yeah, so uh, you know, I'm. I'm I'm really glad that everyone knows I have a taser now or a stunt gun. We yeah, so accurate. they can't break into your house and kill you for making this podcast. I mean, I'll probably fuck up. I'll probably just <laughs> stun myself. <laughs> fuck. But uh, yeah, so um, I know you you people hate me for making this podcast, but you come at me, come at me at your own risk. Please save me. He's had me trapped in his house for months. So today we're doing labyrinth. Yes, we are. <laughs> Uh, this was your choice. Yes, it was. Um, I've to give you a little behind the scenes. I've been moving into a new apartment recently. I've been busy with a lot of different things. We've both been kind of busy with the holidays and family stuff. So we're when we came time to do a recording, I'm like, we need to do an easy movie that we're kind of both on the same page for. Why don't we do Labyrinth? We had talked about doing it before. Um, I have a storied history with this movie, actually, but... You mentioned that before to me, and you didn't elaborate at all. No, oh, yeah. I'm very excited to hear this. So, uh, for all our youngins out there, before you could get any movie conceivable online through various streaming services, you had to go to the a mystical land of Blockbuster Video, where they would sometimes have a movie that you would want to watch that you could rent, and you would return it. Um, a lot of times, my mom to get us movies, she would just pick out a random kid's movie, one that she had heard of, or like one that was made by somebody that we had liked movies by before. Right. Um, most of the time she picked things that we liked, or sometimes it was just sort of, eh, we won't rent that again. For some reason, this movie, we hated it as kids. It was, (laughs) we just did not like it. It was boring. Some parts of it when we were very small scared us. We just did not like this movie. My mom was pretty good. I have to give her credit for like remembering stuff that we liked and didn't like for whatever reason, she could never remember that she had shown us this movie. So there were like four separate occasions where she would rent this movie for us. Just repeatedly putting on labyrinth, insist that we had never seen it before play it. And we'd get the same reaction every time. And I don't know what it is. So that was my experience with that movie for the longest time. I should also add growing up in my household, my parents played two music. Yeah. Two music groups on repeat. And that was like the only music that played in my household, the Beatles and Bruce Springsteen and his E street band. Uh, well, also you've told me that they were a big fan of Mannheim steamroller. What so that? continue. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah, I wasn't that familiar with David Bowie growing up. I think I like, I was, My cousin was a big fan of Queen, so I knew Under Pressure before I really started listening to Bowie. But I only revisited revisited this movie when I first started attending college because by that time I had fallen in love with David Bowie's music. I loved him, and I'm just like, oh, I hated this movie as a kid, but I was a dumb kid. I'll rewatch this. All my friends are watching it in the common area. It's going to be a great time. And I came to the conclusion that Jim Henson is a genius, David Bowie is a genius, if you don't know who either of those two people are, this is not a fun movie to watch. This movie is kind of scattered and not doesn't have a good moral and doesn't have a very consistent performance in the movie. Um, I love the world. I love David Bowie. I love some of the music. I love all of the puppetry because that tickles my everything. Um, take that out of context however you want. Uh, but I don't hate this movie, but I think it is clear that it fails in plenty of areas. And I don't see people talking about that. I see a lot of nostalgia for this movie where people are constantly talking like, Mm -hmm. Oh, remember labyrinth labyrinth is great. I think it's getting a comic book sequel or prequel or whatever coming out soon. Um, I know Jim Henson's other work, the dark crystal is getting a Netflix series soon. So it seemed like an appropriate time to talk about it. But how about you, Austin? What's your Well, I'm glad you mentioned the spinoff because that was actually, um, or just the sequel or whatever when I that that I've been thinking about it lately because I saw that in the headlines. Actually, the title of it is really interesting. They're gonna call it Labyrinth Two Ellipses Your Bulge is a Werewolf. Okay, Austin, you made that joke in the last episode. <laughs> and I'll make it in every fucking episode. 
I'll make it until it stops being amazing. It's. <laughs> but anyway, it was passable the first time. <laughs> but anyway, um, I was actually thinking that our opinions on this movie would wind up being different. I expected you to be more of a fan of this movie purely for the puppetry, sheerly for the puppetry, while acknowledging that it's not as good in other areas. And for me to be uh, clashing against you by fixating too much on just the fact of it being a movie that doesn't work too well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I feel like that really is just the response, right? People really like to dive into this movie and people talk about this movie uh, and treat it with such uh, reverence yes. in some ways. Um, I I'm, I'm know there are people that acknowledge that it has failings, but really I feel like the bottom line for me is that this is not a really good movie. And Jim Henson is always amazing at puppetry. And that is pretty much most of this movie. Uh, I think the script and conception of the characters have a clear idea of what they're going for, but they just totally fuck up what they're trying to do. Like, I think you have almost everything in place except for the fact that the script feels like it is a first draft and uh, written by <laughs> written by Jorge, right? So, like, I don't know. I get that feeling from this movie the more I think about it. He's got his hands in this, Max. He's got his hands in it. George Lucas with his grimy CGI hands. Oh, that just, wasn't just a racist comment. That was, yeah, we're diving right into that. Yeah, the, we're, George Lucas was involved in the production of this movie, maybe more so than some people might know. Um, yeah, I mean, but the thing is, like... He, here's my conception of this movie. Okay. So it, it relies on this dichotomy between the fantasy world and reality. Yes. Right. And the Which arc is not uncommon. No. In fact, it references many stories that rely on the same dichotomy to generate drama and, uh, sort of arrive at some sort of point about their character. Right. And, um, we see the Maurice Sendak, we see Alice in Wonderland, we see wizard of Oz, all sorts of shit. Right. Perfect. It's worked before it can work again. Uh, the thing is, though, this movie, it, it uses that dichotomy as a, uh, a springboard for it, the character development, but it never does anything well or properly with the character, I don't think. I well, think it, it would have to develop the character in order to utilize character development, and I think, honestly, that's where this movie kind of fails the most for yeah. me, is that our main character doesn't really develop at all in the movie. Well, I feel, but the point I'm making specifically is that it shoots itself so hard by making her so unlikable and thus character characterizing like fantasy itself in such a negative light at the beginning that there's nowhere for it to go because it's already like pulled the rug out from under its own feet. You well, know what I mean? Because what I, so what I think, what I think the movie was trying to do is because rewatching it, because I remember it having a much because I think I can get sort of grind some sort of message out of it that thematically it stays for, but it doesn't do it great where it's just like you do have to accept reality, but you can use fantasy as an escapism to help you move forward in reality because sure. that's kind of what she does at the end where it's just like, okay, I'll be responsible and look after my baby brother and right. be nice to my stepmom now but I still have all my imaginary friends to help me out and have a good time and party. But we don't really learn that. She just kind of undergoes a series of different challenges. The labyrinth fucks with her and she doesn't learn a lot. And There's then, not like a progression. No, it just sort of, cause it doesn't establish a starting point. She's just shitty at the beginning. And then she's slightly less shitty at the end. I yeah. Don't. It's like very, it's very, you understand what it's going for, but it just doesn't fucking do it. It's like, it, it just fucks up is what I'm saying. And I guess my, my thing too, is that, uh, it's grappling on to what you're saying. I think it can make for really effective story, right? Particularly when I think I was reminded while watching it this time by, um, uh, a film called the smiling Madame Bode. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that's how it's pronounced, but it's a silent movie. And it also relies on this idea of a specifically, um, feminine subjectivity formation process that involves like this fantasy space and like a sense of performativity within this fantasy space. Although with that, in, within that movie, it's more, it's more related to the characters like immobility. Whereas in this one, it's more about Jennifer Connelly 
the fantasy space, allowing her to be mobile and do all these different things. But the point I'm making is that that is a very reliable narrative device to use as something that is going to drive character development and set up like the plot of your story and the progression of it. And you just don't get any of it in this movie because the script is like backseat so much to the puppetry that it just, and there are movies it feels like a real, there are movies that put like puppetry and practical effects front and center. And I'm willing to be just like, I don't give a shit if the plot's a little weak. Look at yeah. all of this wonderfulness, but those movies, a lot of them have either you're, you have a fully, like, I think the movie that came out slightly before this dark crystal. Sure. By Jim Henson is a good place to start with that where you can distract your audience from not having that great performances and not that solid of a script by putting those things in the background. It's dark like Cri- spectacle. Yes. By dark, dark crystal did that by not having human characters and yeah. having the little puppets. So you focus on those. Uh, Leica films, I still don't fully agree, but like you were talking about how some of the narrative things of Kubo didn't hold up for you. You don't have real actors in that movie. You have the, the figures that people are voice acting behind. Right. By putting the world front and center, you can distract people from the fact that other areas of your movie are lacking. The fact that this movie not only has our main protagonist be a human girl, but also to have our only other humanoid protagonist, or not protagonist, but character. Humanoid? Yes. <laughs> You're referring to David Bowie as a humanoid. Yes. Um, be David fucking Bowie. That's going to distract people from the fantasy world you've created because it's David Bowie and he himself is a wonderful, marvelous fantasy world. So it kind of fails in that. And I know Jim Henson really wanted to, he wanted to play with the idea of this teenage girl's imagination for what, a rock star is like, and he's sort of some mythological being. Right. And you can see that in David Bowie's costume design. And if you're going to make that David Bowie's an excellent casting choice, but it seems to be at odds with what the movie is trying to achieve narratively. Well, yeah. I mean, it's also just, I think it's less that it's at odds and it's more just that they don't execute on any of the things they wanted to. They set up that she has flaws in the beginning but like I like you brought up Kubo, right? I wish they could take some of the flaws from this character, lend them to Kubo a little bit, and then take some of the good things <laughs> that Kubo does because there's no reason for us to like her at all at the beginning. And you can't recover from that because there's no reason for us to find value in fantasy. And yet that is the way she has... That is the mode through which she has to defeat David Bowie. And it's already been shown to us to be just some like shitty, stupid thing. Like, what is the value in it? It's just a childish thing. Which also... I wouldn't necessarily agree with in reality, but also in the movie, it's like you could take it that way and say it is just bad, but then you have to change other things about the movie. So it's sort of like, I think in, in like hitting the notes way too hard that she has flaws in the beginning, it just messes up the entire structure. And also it doesn't help that like just on a scene by scene basis, I think it just, it has a lot of weak scenes. Yeah. Um, I w- I do want to say beforehand, yeah. um, I overall don't think this is a good movie. Um, it is also not a good movie that I have seen a lot and I will watch again in the future because sure. even though like there's a difference between destroying things you love because you should be critical. There's a difference with criticizing and being critical. I just think critically, this isn't a very good movie. That doesn't mean that you can enjoy it and watch it and find joy in love and even some connection with the main character, even though neither of us could do that. Um, I plan on watching this movie plenty more times because even though they don't do a lot with the world, I love the world they create. I also love David Bowie. I love one of the songs in this movie. It's not, (laughs) it's not even like a repo situation where the songs are laughably bad to the point where I can sing along and have a good time. It's just like, there's one song that sounds like it could be a shitty David Bowie B-side, and that's it. You're talking about the Fire Goblins one, where they're ripping their heads off? Oh, yes, of course. No, yeah. those were the things that scarred me as a child. Um, <laughs> I hated those things. They terrified me. But, yeah. Um, yeah. I, so I'm, this is a bad movie that I will continue to watch. I think I agree with that. We're, we might sound like we're coming down hard on it, because... We're just going to find are. things to poke <laughs> holes in. But it's, I feel like my opinion towards this movie is indifferent. I yeah. think the, like, just Jim Henson's 
ability to create interesting scenarios with the uh, the effects and just like you know con- conceiving of different ideas with like uh, the the hamburger helpers or whatever they're called. What are those? What like the the yeah the, the hand, hands that the hand wall yeah um but like that's an interesting idea in of itself right this movie is full of ideas and Jim Henson is clearly the guy who's having those and I still find that creative I don't I don't like harbor a lot of ill will towards this movie I just you know I I don't think it's that good and I sort of chuckle to myself when I see like really long articles on websites talking about how like there's very intricate symbolism in this movie or whatever, which sure you could look into symbolism, symbolism in this movie, but when it's failing to do the simpler structural things in its story, I don't really have a, like an incentive to do that or place a lot of value or significance. You can, on you can and should do that, but also that could be interpreted as people being nostalgic for this movie, looking back, realizing it's not as good as they remember it being, and then trying to find some deeper meeting where there's not necessarily anything. I wonder, I mean, there's probably a ton of movies like that, but as far as this one goes, I think it's not like a very egregious, no, like a fender. And like, this is a harmless movie to like, I'm not going to be mine. I'm going to hate you. If you like this movie, um, I'll watch it with you. We'll have a good time. Um, let's listen to some Ziggy Stardust. Like afterwards, it's sure. Like, I own a little figure of Jareth I have in my room. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Just because I was like, yeah, I want to own, I already have, like, Ziggy Stardust, the album, and, like, a frame. And I was like, I want to own a little David Bowie thing. And I saw that. And I was like, I'll take a Jareth. Why not? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, any criticism I have of this movie, take it note that I own merchandise from this movie. <laughs> so That's true. There you go. So, yeah. I don't know what else to say about this movie other than, do you want to just mention the bulge thing now? Oh, yeah. Listen, we know. Yes. Uh, we probably won't. Well, maybe we will. We have some other... Yeah, we have a lot of trivia about this movie, but... I I've, think it depends on how lazy we get with the jokes. Yes. We can, we can always resort to bulge jokes because it is ubiquitous in oh, this yeah. movie. Um, the one piece of trivia... I think most people know this about Labyrinth, but every time I talk to people about it, they don't know. Um, David Bowie, his dick is front and center in this movie. You see it at like all times. It kind of overshadows him at some points. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was top build. Yes. Uh funny thing about that they had to stop production of this movie because they were trying to design a cod piece to make his dick look smaller because it was just did they actually have to stop the entirety of the production at least part of it yes okay um which is wonderful and ridiculous also it didn't work like (laughs) the fact that you had to do that and then it just failed utterly i i wonder how bad it was originally that oh god yeah i just can't even imagine that situation but anyway, we should all be prepared, but be prepared to stop your movie because your actor's dick is too big. Um, and that's the real lesson that we should learn from Labyrinth. Yeah, uh, I will always remember that going forward in my own career. Uh, I'll ask for measurements of everybody. <laughs> yes. Uh, in, in your casting calls, be sure to ask for headshots, height, previous roles and uh, dick size and length. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> is that the proper note to begin the discussion of the movie? I was okay <laughs> to begin it quite a while ago. All right. Let's open up our storybooks and escape into the wonderful fantasy land of Labyrinth, everyone. Let's magic jump into this. You've said magic jump twice. The song is called Dance Magic Dance. Now, Max, I hope you're ready for what is certainly one of the most distractingly uh, poorly aged title sequences in film history. Uh, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, there are scenes in this movie that don't age that well. (laughs) Uh, Are you a fan of this owl? No. I I guess my question. This owl has a place in cinematic history, though. Because it's the first owl. No, it's the first CGI animal ever. Yeah, I believe so. So that's, that's significant, regardless. George Lucas. That is, it is a very George Lucas thing, but like, for what? I guess you have to start somewhere. It's 1986, like. But also, like. That's fine. I'm fine. What is it? The Adventures of Young Sherlock Holmes or whatever? Have you seen that? I haven't seen the movie, but I've seen, that was like a Pixar thing. That was the first CGI character, right? And that looks, that still looks good. And that was like 80, what, 83? I don't know. But either way, you've got like the the digital text effects and everything. Oh man. It's whatever. I'm fine with that. It's yeah. a minor thing. 
of her title. It's something I like making fun of this movie for, (laughs) but that's pretty much all it is. But you know what? It is indicative of the weird, uh, uh, George Lucas sification of this movie that I'm noticing more and more. The oh more yeah, I well I, t- I told you something about that that you didn't know that um because the screenplay for this movie, the original one, apparently Jim Henson hated it, so he brought in uh other screenwriters to do it. Terry Jones, Ter- is credited. Yeah, Terry Jones is the only credited one. Apparently, his first draft um made it into the movie, but George Lucas, who was already involved in the production of this movie, was brought in to patch up some of the things from the script. Oof. I don't know. It's never been really been said. Um, which ones did? Uh, so who else did it? It was a uh, Elaine May who what also was one of the people who brought in to patch up the script. Elaine May. Yeah, Heaven Can Wait. Elaine May. Yes, director of yes Ishtar. Yeah, and I mean people shit on that movie even though it's really not that bad at all. Um, but. More importantly, she's a fantastic director in her own right. Yeah, no, she was brought in to help patch this up. Um, well, it, that's strange. They came with a script that Henson liked. Wow. Yeah, it, you know, I'm not. I didn't remember how long the all segment went on for. Um, <laughs> because it's fine if you don't look at it too much. Like if it's just sort of like this slightly magical, like ooh, weird effect. I'm fine with that. But I forgot how fucking long this goes on. Jesus. <laughs> Honestly, not a terrible transition, though. No, that, maybe you're just really glad that it's not the CGI one anymore. No, but it, like it, they framed it properly. Mm-hmm. But here we go. We begin with the movie where I feel like after you're like slapped in the face with the owl thing for two minutes, you're maybe not catching on to things as quickly, at least in my experience. But we get the 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 uh, lines that she's going to repeat at the end, and of course, this establishes the. Uh, the device of like the Miz on a beam of this movie where she has the, what is it? A play or a story that's called labyrinth within this movie it's called labyrinth. Yeah, sure. Whatever it is. Um, it represents her fantasy kingdom that she's created in her mind. Right. And so yes. we begin in the fantasy kingdom and then it's like a fun subversion that, Oh, she's just acting. And then the hero she's addressing or whatever is her dog. <laughs> right. Oh, what a good dog. What a good shaggy dog. Merlin, the dog. Yes. And then also we get a carryover from our last episode, too, where this idea of an oppressive reality or system uh, coming against our protagonist is represented by the clock. Not only now, but throughout the movie, right? Yeah. <laughs> that dog did not want to run. Setting up some like imagery in this movie already. But again... The moment she like opens her mouth to her family, it's all just like over because she's so terrible to them. And she is. Um, and like the stepmother isn't seen as like particularly cruel or evil. No. Or anything. She's just like, can you stop playing around and look after your infant brother? I would appreciate it. Yeah. And they're like, we only ask you to do it when we think you're available. And if you said you weren't, we wouldn't ask you. Yeah. And of course we are going to believe the stepmom because... She's the one who's not like screaming at the top of her lungs and didn't have a conniption fit when her baby brother was playing with one of her teddy bears. Um, yeah. Uh, what do you think of her performance in general? Oh, you mean Jennifer Connelly's? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I don't think it's good, but I think it's the same problem that I have with maybe David Bowie's in this movie as well, which is, and very much so with the babies. But um, like it's more of a matter, it's more of a matter of like I think the story itself and the direction of the actors, that there's nowhere for them to go for this performance. You know, she's being directed to be like a brat, right? And she nails that. But in the way they set up this character, it's like, what space yeah. does she have to grow in now? You know. Really, what I feel like this movie's other problem is is. We see the references, right, to Wizard of Oz, Where the Wild Things Are, and Alice, but it can't really choose which version of that story it wants to be. You know, it's like, is this Wizard of Oz where we're setting up, like, things that are going to be repeated in the fantasy landscape from her real life? Oh, well, those we have that set up. All of these things are set up. We have all her. this set up, but it's not like we have characters. No. Like, are, is her, like, adventurers she meets? There's a, a Didymus right there, yeah. right? But it's like... But it's not like Didymus is a character she interacts with. You know what I mean? 
It'd be different if Didymus was a character she interacted with here and she treated rudely or something. Also, this is the super important subtext that you totally miss that we need to get back to once I finish this. Well, it's supposed to be because... Hold on one second. Okay. Let me just get this out of the way. But I mean, like, if Didymus was a character she met in the reality portion of this movie and then she treated the Didymus character poorly or something and then she has to rectify that same decision in her adventure, that makes sense in my mind. You know what I mean? Because now that's like something she's interacting with. You know, it's not just a doll that she has. Yeah. And it actually shows you something about her character and how she's behaving socially. Um, also, Judge Dredd. Did you see that? No. That's weird. Well, she beat out. I she, am the law. She beat out a lot of more talented actresses for this role, though. Really? Helena Bottom Carter, Laura Dern, they applied for Laura them. Dern? Yeah. Um, this is the same year as Blue Velvet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's crazy. She beat out a lot of fucking crazy people for this role, and it kind of... like I don't know why she was necessarily cast. I'm not sure what Henson really saw in her, but like maybe it's just like the every girl that... He's a big Argento guy. This is after Phenomena. Yeah. Um, this movie would be more interesting if she could talk to Bugs. I would appreciate that. But yeah, no, she'd be at Well, out. she does talk to a worm. Well, yeah, but that's an adorable little worm. But anyway, I. Ooh, that's a fun cut, even though I feel like it's maybe a little bit random. But uh, because it's not like there's an inkling of goblins coming. It's just like, oh, the goblins are here. And you're like, wait, we didn't know goblins were in this movie yet. I I like that. But because it kind of sells like this is all an imagination thing. Yeah, I don't know. uh, And the the goblins just being there are just like, oh, okay, cool. I like the contrast of cutting back and forth. It's a great idea. I think this is the most clever the movie gets is this bit right here specifically the moment where she wishes him gone and then he stops crying immediately that is perfect that's like a almost a sublime moment where it really sells like an oh fuck type of response to having made a very very bad decision right but also the one thing i wanted to mention about this specific sequence is that i kind of enjoy the fact that they're setting it up so that she kind of authors her own like challenges she has to overcome. She's talking about how the Goblin King is in love with her and blah, 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 blah. She's authoring the story that she will have to progress through. Yes, which is why I wanted to bring up the whole play Bill David Bowie thing because yeah, exactly the Goblin King is a projection of like... Of that dude. A little girl or like a teenage girl's like idolization of a pop star, which, okay, I'll take that. If it was actually just like David Bowie. It's even more specific than that. Yeah. Where, okay, this is really reading into the subtext, but the other person on the playbill and the, like, memorabilia around her mirror, yeah, that's her mother. That's her real mother, right? And you have to look into it because the movie does not really communicate this at all, even though it's, like, planted in there, right? And it's just plastered over that one shot. The, the whole backstory of this is that her mother was like, I don't know, having an affair with David Bowie, who was another actor star or something, right? There's a whole situation there, and we have to assume that her mother (laughs) is now gone. Oh, you're talking about that. Okay. (laughs) See, when you brought that up to me first, I thought you meant, like, in real life, David Bowie was having sex with this actress's mother. Um, No! (laughs) Which, I mean, he might have. I I don't know. He's David Bowie, let's be fair. But, uh, yeah, like, yeah, that's the moment that I think is is sells the creepiness of this. Well, I really love that. It's simple, easy to do, makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's just simple. Just stop the crying immediately. But uh, like, I wonder if David Bowie did the crying noises for that. Cause he does make the, ba- <laughs> he, oh, oh, oh. He, no, he does make the baby noises during a uh, magic dance. What? Yeah. But, yeah. Ah, like the random baby noises. That was <laughs> him making the noises. Okay. Do you think that was his idea or George Lucas's? <laughs> You can't just blame everything you don't like about this movie on George Lucas. I think you're going to start blaming everything in every movie that I don't like on George Lucas. (laughs) Ending of Psycho. uh, Yeah. (laughs) Some of the lolly moments in Tokyo Drifter. Just like, you know, all that was George Lucas. Just retroactively went back and digitally re-edited all these movies. No. George Lucas can't touch Tokyo Drifter. Is that a challenge? No, for the love of Christ. 
<laughs> oh my god, there was an onion article I saw that reminded me of you because like I could see you like having convulsions if you thought it was real. What? And it's like David Lynch finally releases a Blu-ray colorized version of a racer head. <sighs> no, he would never. And it do just that. looks terrible. <laughs> Someone else might try to do that. David Lynch would maybe murder them. <laughs> the Get se- real. The second after he dies, <laughs> it's just like eraser head in color. Finally. Yeah. The eraser head you've been waiting for. <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about this bit that I thought was interesting was maybe the potential idea of, you know, her family kind of almost forcing her into a mothering position. Right. Well, I always got the impression that... By taking care of the brother. The brother, yeah. And that she's... Oh, the glitter. (laughs) Just the glitter bomb. Actually, fun fact about the production of that, they didn't need a prop for that. David Bowie just explodes... Yeah, explodes glitter whenever... Just comes out of pores. Yeah, Yeah. whenever he walks anywhere. Yeah, of course. But yeah, I... Can I be real with you right now? I kind of think that intro is lazy and bad. Oh, yeah. It's silly and hilarious. I had this idea in my head where it would be like... I don't know. I know you got to focus on doing everything in a specific way for this movie, but I feel like that's just, just for him to be like, and here I am. The only touch of cleverness about that is the shadow. And that's an obvious decision, but like, wouldn't it be better if they just like introduced him in like a mirror or something, right? She's looking into the mirror and then suddenly he's in her reflection, (laughs) right? The contact juggling. Yes. Uh, Can you tell that it's someone else's arm? Uh, they did a very good job of that. The I, angles are pretty good, and yeah. it's like... That's a fun fact. They, David Bowie couldn't do that shit. He's not, unfortunately, not that amazing um, at juggling. So they had to hire somebody to stick his hands through his costume and do all the fun ball tricks f- for him. And they did a pretty good job. If you know you're looking for it, you can kind of figure it out. But otherwise, it's pretty seamless. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the CG in this movie. I think it also helps that you just assume, well, well, that's weird. I yeah. bet he can do that. <laughs> and the fact that like the movement is slightly unnatural itself. Like, yeah. But you know what's really weird about that is if you look up contact juggling balls, that's literally just what that is. Yeah. So it's like, it's like, wait, is it just that the king? So like, what is that object in the fantasy world? Is it that the Goblin King just really likes contact juggling it's and a- this one's magical? Because that's literally just what they sell online. Yeah. Well, it's a crystal ball. Yeah. Matte painting. Wonderful. Yeah. This, this transition, particularly, I think, very reminiscent of uh, where the wild things are. Right? Where her yeah. room just becomes the kingdom. I love how he's only wearing slightly more makeup than he was in, like, the casual behind-the-scenes interview. He's wearing a wig and, like, slightly darker makeup. Yeah, I mean, but this is the whole thing where it feels like both of us agree that David Bowie is... I'm going to say, well, he's not an actor, but he he ha- he can be a very powerful screen presence. He's a performer. Yes, he's a star. He yeah. has charisma. But you have to be clever in the way you utilize that in your movie. And I don't think this movie does that. I think it does it. I just don't think it consistently does it throughout the entire time. Um, well, it tries to. And I think it partially succeeds just by the fact of it being David Bowie. Yes, that's the thing. Yeah. I've said before, if you don't know who David Bowie is and have no attachment to him, this movie gets infinitely worse. I mean, I think you still find him striking. No, he's yeah. definitely like, even if like... But it could be way better. Yeah, even as a kid when I saw yeah. this, like the Goblin King is obviously the most visually... Like in- change his appearance throughout the thing. Yeah. Make him... Well, he does different. change outfits quite a bit. But- right, but it's just the outfits. And it's yeah. like, it's very simple. Oh, here's... Uh, Hoggle. H- Hoggle. The most difficult puppet to uh operate it is pretty impressive but i just before we get too far from it i just wanted to go back and uh comment on the fact that as she begins her journey she starts with the line well come on feet yeah (sighs) jeez louise yeah it to be fair that does kind of feel like something that would be written in like a (laughs) silly fantasy story so whatever i don't know um you know what maurice sendak in lewis carroll uh, were never writers that would write something that was that dumb. <laughs> yeah. <But laughs> I've any- never read, uh, you know, Wizard of Oz, so I can't speak about, to, you know, Frank L. Baum. But uh, yeah. Those well, that does, like, that does kind of feel like something like in the Chronicles of Narnia or something like that, like one of the younger siblings would say. So I, I don't know. It feel, kind of has that feel. Yeah, but I, um, 
Yeah, d- fun fact about the Hoggle puppet. Did you know they lost it after the production of this movie? I, okay. Did you hear where it ended up? It ended up in an airport museum, right? In an air, in a museum of unclaimed luggage. Yeah. In New Orleans? It's one of the air. It's such a bizarre. It's somewhere down south. It's just the fact that it's like, it's a museum of unclaimed luggage specifically to that area. Yeah. Well, they had some other fun stuff. Like they said, there's like samurai swords and shit that they have there. Um, I'm surprised that's not a reality TV show. Uh, Alabama. Alabama. Scottsboro, Alabama. That's so fucking weird. But yeah, so the Hoggle Puppet apparently to this day is still hanging out there. Um, if you want to go check it out. <laughs> They've also got the missing reels of the Magnificent Ampersons. Fun coincidence. I'm sure there's one other person that's really liking that joke right now. I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, you know what? Orson Welles' last movie came out this year. Yeah. He's topical, people. <laughs> He's always topical. I love, I do, like I've said before, I love the world this creates. Like, even if it is a mishmash of ideas at a lot of points, mm-hmm. like, it kind of flows together very conducively. It looks great because it's a Jim yeah. Henson production, but I don't think we should take that for granted because, like, there have been other genius creators that have gotten lazy and just sort of like, eh, it's me. I can phone this one in. But no, he gave his all to every production. Even if the entire movie wasn't great, the world always looks wonderful. Well, uh, can I ask you about this? Yes. With In reference to that, I feel like this movie is missing a lot of the uh, cleverness that I associate with Jim Henson's stuff in terms of like just the construction and conception of just the story, you know, the story. Yes. Um, I, 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 just, I also think that, um, cause from what I heard, he really wanted to try to get away from the Muppets. Like he didn't want that to be the only thing people remembered him for. Right. So he tried to make the design, the story, like everything as far away from the Muppets as he could. Right. And I think that by going out of your way to do that and separate yourself from your, like your greatest creative achievement, it, might hurt your story overall together. And you know what? He might, we've mentioned George Lucas. Maybe that's a comparable situation. If you've made something that's that successful and ubiquitous in culture, right? How do you manage to actually break free of that and and develop your own artistic uh, sort of uh, style and personality that stands apart? Maybe this movie is, is still successful because Jim Henson just has way more, you know, creative resources to drop on than yeah. George. Oh, well, of course he fucking did, but <laughs> George Lucas is not quite as talented as Jim Henson, but I don't know. I, I still feel like there's something lacking in terms of how uh, clever this movie is visually too. I feel like Jim Henson is underrated as a director because I think people again, look at the Muppets only and they seem to neglect like a lot of the really amazing and fun shorts that he made leading up to the Muppets. Yeah. Um, I think my favorite of his shorts is maybe like timepiece where it's just so like funny and creative and, uh, just that type of that specific type of playfulness and cleverness is, is very visual in that movie. And I feel like I know they're making a broad big budget movie for this, right? Yes. But I feel like some of that is still missing in this, you know, I think he starts throwing the camera around when they get to the, uh, the ending with the MC Escher painting, but like, I don't know. It's just, I don't know. It's just feels so straightforward a lot of the time. And it's like, I, I understand that this is made by master, you know, uh, workers and like crafts people. Um, cause everything like, looks look at amazing. This. Look but at this. Uh, like we have like the scene, like this does look like the labyrinth that goes on forever, even though this is clearly like a set with a matte painting behind it, it fits perfectly. And it's kind of adds like a surrealist quality to it which works in this dreamlike fantasy world. Yes. Oh, I love the worm puppet. These, I, the idea of like the eyeball moss yeah. on this wall. The little details he populates, yeah. which like add hours upon hours of extra work just for these tiny little mm-hmm. things. And just the, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and say this uh, worm is great. Yes. <laughs> There's uh, nothing. This worm is the best part of the movie. And like those lines are good. Yeah. It's like, Oh me? No, I'm just a worm. Yeah. Right. Like there's something very charming, charming and like simple. Well, about yeah, that. No, the line is just like, did you just say hello? No, I said hello, but that's close enough. <laughs> like that's cute. I love it. Oh. Yeah. It's not trying too hard. It's just, yeah. it is what it is. 
And sometimes you get get moments of that in this yeah. movie, but it's not something that it sustains, and it's surrounded by things that are just kind of random and not nearly as good. This is this does feel like because I would never say that any of the stuff in this movie is like uninspired or uninteresting, but it does kind of feel that Jim Henson had a lot of ideas that he hadn't used on other projects, and he put them all in Labyrinth for some of the things. And maybe that's possible. Um, I mean, you're talking about the way he like tries to distinguish himself from the Muppets. I yeah. think Dark Crystal is feels like a way more definitive attempt. Yes. In, in the sense that it's like you you get a, I feel like a stronger idea of what that movie is going for than this. You know, maybe it's just the fact that there are no people in it at all, right? Because there's still like not sometimes it's not the best movie in terms of its script and everything, yeah. but like. The fact that there's no like live action stuff, it's like you understand they're going for an idea of an end product that is like different from what you might expect. Whereas this, it's kind of just unclear the entire time. And, uh, yeah, they're just talented at what they do. It's just, I don't know, it's not focused. She's coming, Toby. You don't care about Toby. Why don't you just climb up to the top of the labyrinth and like start trying to climb on the walls? They don't look that high. You can do it. I suppose that would be a really big fucking problem in the design of your labyrinth. Yeah. I mean, we see it magically move later and like do other things. So maybe just like shit happens. <gasps> There's the pig. Yes. There's the pig. The pig dressed as a goblin with the little horns and everything. I love that. Uh, I would say this is the most iconic scene in the movie. This is the one that people constantly reference when yes. you bring the movie up. It's, it's the song that we both... No, it's got e the name of yeah. wrong. <laughs> it's easily the best song in the movie, though. Yes. Like, no competition. Yes. Um, but here's my question, too. Yes. Now that we're talking about the song, what are they talking about? Um, I believe they're talking about turning the baby into a goblin. Are they? Yes. Is that what they want the baby for? Yes. Okay. That's what she says earlier on. I wish they would take you away to the goblin city and you would be turned into a goblin. Okay, um, what do they get by doing that? Well, I know in like old like fae lore or whatever, like for like fairies and old timey things, the only way they could make new ones is to s steal a human baby, and they I would have to because this is very heavily based on old timey things. Sure, but does this movie indicate that that's the that's the rule? Oh, they trap that bird under. Yeah. Head. Well, I don't think we're gonna go too in depth into goblin reproductive cycles in this movie. Well, but I was going to because I had a question about. Is David, but he's the Goblin King. Yes. But is he a goblin? Uh, I guess so. Or did he conquer them? <laughs> he just showed up one day. He's like, I'm your king. And they're like, it's David fucking Bowie. I'm not saying no, man. Right. Oh, this is like a genuinely charming and fun scene regardless, though. I mean, it's trying really hard. Oh, my God. There's like a lot of chickens. They have, in the scene. They have a lot of everything. Like, I didn't even Why remember. Why did they have so many chickens? I didn't even remember that, like halfway through a bird like a puppet bird flies through the middle of that mm -hmm. why would you do that jim henson that adds a lot of work you could possibly see the fucking string like that's a terrible idea that looks pretty good it looks great but uh again here's a your mother is a fragging aardvark that, the I, idea I of using the insult. lipstick right yeah. I feel like, okay, now we're bringing in something from the real world. But now the dichotomy is not that she's like addressing the, the real, because the drama of this movie is that the fantasy situation now has very real world consequences, yes. right? Um, and it's forcing her to confront the real world in a way that she wasn't before. Yeah. And that's her art. Oh my God, that baby looks terrified. Fun fact about that baby. The baby was fucking terrified of David Bowie the entire time. I mean, it's time. screaming the entire song. And apparently the outfit he didn't like, they were distracting the baby with like a squeaky toy off the set to try to keep him from. I mean, you're just surrounded by like puppets and like people in outfits and it's a long day. Well, apparently I, those puppets. Look at it, it's crying. Yeah. Apparently the puppets had an impact on that child because he went to, on to work at Leica. Oh, yeah. Um, which I find wonderful. Yeah, a little cocaine snort there. Um, yeah, we totally missed that weird moment where he does the... <laughs> uh, but yeah, well, his father was one of the production designers for this movie, so it was obviously around him his entire life. Sure. But I find that to be a fun little thing. Right. Especially since we've talked about Leica before on the studio, or on the podcast. I was about to say on the studio. Well, we do have a studio, don't we? Yes, this incredibly yeah. expensive, luxurious studio we... I have been trapped in for months. <laughs> we do have to upgrade the fire alarm. Yes. Oh. 
Oh, careful, David Bowie. Mm. Oh, oh. But yeah, I the one thing I wanted to... Oh, no, David. I love how he just gets bored with the baby halfway through. And and he's, he's like, like oh, no, I changed my mind again. Yeah. He really is on coke, isn't he? Who wasn't? It was the 80s. I want that to be a Chucky doll. <laughs> you son of a bitch! <laughs> Put me down. Oh, uh, God. But I'm... anyway, the thing I wanted to mention again, she's using the lipstick to resolve this issue, right? Yeah. And the dichotomy is supposed to be that she's using the fantasy resources to address the, the real-world issues and consequences, right, of her brother being disappeared by David Bowie or yeah. transformed. But the thing is, technically what she's doing now is she's using a real world object to combat fantasy. Right. You could argue maybe that the lipstick is part of the performative element in the sense that it's makeup, right? In that sort of way, but it's not focused in how it's doing this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I want her to interact more with this world in terms of like a personal personal interaction. You know, like it's, it's almost similar to like my pr big problem with inception when it came out is that it's like this dream world and anything can happen. Right. And then it's just like high scenes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You get the, the one where the George, sorry, Joseph I'm distracted by like, I always get distracted by the wonderful little creatures and oh, the, inhabitants uh, of the world, the liars paradox situation yeah. going on. Which one would, What's the answer to this? Which one would well, the, the other person? Well, one tells the truth and one tells the lie, and you don't know which. Yes. Right? Uh, you ask them, what would the other yes. person say the right door is? Because, and then you do the opposite of what the answer is. Yes, because the liar will lie and say the, <laughs> the yeah, his door, yes. and then the truth teller would say that it would be the yep. liar's door, and then you go on the other one. Yes, very famous paradox. I learned that from Yu-Gi-Oh! when I was a kid. Thanks, Yu-Gi-Oh! But here's the... Th okay. Man, we can't finish a point because it's like, no. This it's movie, very this movie, and weird. It does. It keeps well. It's going to slow down you. eventually. You know what I mean? Yes, and that's its problem too. Honestly, but, if this movie had kept like just throwing different shit at you, like the entire yeah. Time. Well, that's again going back to the Inception thing. It's like yeah. you get the crazy anti gravity sequence, which is cool. But does a lot of weird shit happen in that movie? It's supposed to be a dream. You know, I want to see like weird things constantly. Right. Even if it's subtle, weird things. And in this, it's like, I want to see more weird, crazy obstacles in, in the labyrinth and more get the sense of like, deliberately, this is an obstacle course, right? That is yeah. designed to challenge you. Also, like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, apparently the stunt was incredibly dangerous because like the lift they had her on, like if she moved her hand the wrong way while it was uh, pulling her up. Yeah. It would have like. Could have severed her fingers. <gasps> Ooh, Luckily, that Jesus. did not happen. What about these guys' fingers? I don't know. I do love this, though. It's a I mean, I love this. I do feel uncomfortable just by the idea of this. I don't know if it's by design. Just of a 15-year-old girl being like held up by like, I think hands that's, in a wall. I think that's us watching it as adults rather than like the intended, like, this is supposed to be a creepy thing for children. It's just like hands. You don't know where they're I from. They're I wouldn't. Hands. I wouldn't. Regardless of their intent, I mean, I don't necessarily care. But like, I wouldn't necessarily put it past somebody to play for both audiences in that sense. Uh, but either way, you. It's hard to argue that this scene is effective. You mm -hmm. know. But yeah, like again, a very interesting like idea. It's so, so, such a weird thing to think about. But the one thing I also wanted to go and pick up is uh, when she does the the liar's paradox solution, right? Yes. She says, oh, now I know the answer. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, whoa, 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 what? Now you know the answer? You had to solve the liar's paradox before? Yeah. That's what I'm saying where this movie is kind of confused about itself. It's like, is, this, is there some sort of corollary in the real world where you had to do that? Well, yeah, because we don't like spend any time in the real world. Yeah. We establish that she doesn't like her stepmother. Her stepmother's strict. Her dad is kind of just, eh. Yeah, it only establishes that she's shitty and annoying. Yes. Um, it's like you had to be more patient in the beginning because now it's like, it's confusing. And it's like, because we don't know, she like tells us because she's like, oh, now I finally understand. It's like, okay, you're saying now that you've made progress as a person but we don't know why or towards what or in what sense because we don't know where you started from. Yeah. 
And here's some of the uh, symbolism that people will talk about is the oubliette means like to forget things or whatever. Yeah. It's from French and this is this or blah, 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 blah. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> this movie is not doing the basic things. I guess you can talk about these as like interesting set pieces and ideas, which they are, but I don't know. And that you can not do like some of the basic the things in surrealist films because you're trying to have the entire movie just sort of be like throwaway narrative. But this movie wants to have a narrative, but just doesn't deliver on it is the problem. And it does have some surrealist themes in it, whether you're talking about narratively or design wise. Obviously, there's more obvious things later on for that. But well, when you say surrealism, you mean mostly just like the fact of random crazy things happening, right? Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like you could point that out, but this movie overall does want to have a more straightforward yeah. fairy tale narrative, and it kind of it, fails. You at need that. a structure for that. Yes. You know? And it's like what you're saying is exactly right because it's like in order to be effective, you want to go in a direction, you know? Or you have to just be good enough to balance everything perfectly, which is going to be a rare movie that does that. Um, but it's like, you could do a movie where there is the yeah. minimal structure, but you have to then really turn up the volume on like the power and potency of these like bizarre situations that she finds herself in, you know? Yeah. Cause they have to be interesting enough to keep things going and they have to keep presenting ideas, you know? Then they don't, but <sighs> Hoggle is the most likable character in this movie. <laughs> yeah, although I feel like they sort of shortchange his character by having him, like David Bowie confront him immediately about yeah. his decision. I know he goes back and forth, but at a certain point, just feels like he's being capricious. Oh, look at those skeleton right there. Wrong door. Oh uh, yeah, Hoggle's actually a murderer. We don't <laughs> talk about this. <laughs> he just likes the plastic bracelet, so he decided not to. This is the prequel to Lord of the Rings and Shelob's lair. I was just rewatching a uh, fellowship of the ring. Cause that's the one yeah. I revisit the least out of them. Okay. Cause two towers and return to the King. Holy shit. Oh, I like these guys. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I love the whole, like they take offense to it. You know, I'm yeah. right now. I'm thinking, I'm going to add to what we're saying about the weirdness of her like progress as a, as a character in this where one way to do this movie where you have very little time spent in the real world. Yeah. You, you needed a little more grounding in reality if you want. The... Well, here's the thing yes. that's sort of trending more towards wizard of Oz, right? Where you rely on that structure for the corollaries between the fantasy and the real, but you go with the other thing it references, which is Alice's adventures in Wonderland, where there's very, very little time spent in the real world before Alice starts following that rabbit down the hole. Yes. Um, but the thing that makes that movie or that movie, the thing that makes that book, uh, work is the fact that it is focused not on like telling a story of like structure, but pure like progression in terms of Alice's like cognitive decision-making. You know? Yeah. There's not like symbolism in that book that you can like really pick apart that's like incredibly deep, although I'm sure people will. And you might even gain something insightful from that. But the the baseline of that book is that like she is going to take information from seemingly incongruous events in front of her and then make a rational decision. And that's like her arc to the point where she can stand up under pressure and under trial in a situation that makes no sense. Yeah. But you have to focus on the cognitive part of every situation she ends up in in order to make that work. And you can sort of do that with the liar's paradox situation, but that's the only situation like that that we get in this movie, I think, right? Oh, God. We get a lot of things, but, like, yeah. Um, and maybe, like, because the whole love thing with her and the Goblin King, like, the only really other thing we get that is like we get that she doesn't go out on dates because her stepmom is like, yeah, that's if the you had thing. dates, we wouldn't ask you to babysit. The fantasy is now, and we did we mention that the clock is 13 hours? We've been noticing it the whole time. We just didn't say it. Well, yeah, but that's, yeah. I like that. That's just, yeah, that's fun. Jim Henson likes populating his worlds with fun little ideas. Yeah. And why not? It's more fun than the obvious David Bowie faces and the rocks everywhere. Yeah. We get it. Ooh. <laughs> 
This is this whole miniature is one of my favorites in the movies. Uh, not miniature. It's this is actually a full size puppet, I believe. But um, yeah, just the prop itself. Yeah, but just like the fact that it's like this evil death drill with more drills on it because why not? Because fuck you. Mm-hmm. Um, and oh, I brought up Yu Gi Oh before. There's a thing called Labyrinth Tank that looks almost exactly like that. I wonder if it was influenced by that. Anyway, um, and then you see it's. On the other side, it's just tiny little people pedaling like bicycle things. <laughs> um, but yeah, as far as the romance thing goes, like maybe show her like not having the confidence to like talk to boys or like do something so that when she gets back into the real world, she's like, oh, I dealt with the fucking Goblin King and right. rejected him. I can deal with Bradley now. Um, <laughs> fucking Bradley. Yeah. Why didn't you ask the nerdy girl to the dance, Bradley? Made her hallucinate David Bowie. Yeah. Weirdly. Oh, Bradley made her? Yeah. I'm doing Oh, my it. God. Poor Bradley. Because Bradley said... Poor Bradley. He sounds like the bad guy in this. Well, because Bradley didn't ask... Well, Bradley doesn't even know that she likes him. Because Brad, she's too shy to talk to boys. Because oh, she's God. too busy LARPing in the park, apparently. Um, oh, God. This movie just, like, fucked up with Bradley. Yeah. Bradley is really just... What the fuck? Come on. Bradley's the best character in the movie. The one that we just made up. Um... But yeah, I, I, you know, I, it's just, yeah, it's all the same idea, right? Is that it's, conf- <laughs> it's confusing. That's a great line, what? honestly. Listen, you've got to understand my position. I'm a coward and Jareth scares me. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's <laughs> wonderful. Um, I don't know. I like blatant humor. Just sort of like, no, this is. Well, okay. You brought up the romance and it does yeah. kind of feel like it's coming out of nowhere. Right. Because again, they don't set it up beforehand. It just speaks to what we're saying about this movie, not sort of like getting it's like getting it's like ducks lined up in a row. Yeah. Right. Where it's like you have all this shit. You just need to choose what you're doing. But like it becomes more of a prominent, prominent thing later. And I, I feel like I'm OK with this idea of like exercising this strange kind of manipulative and malevolent. And if you think about it, like kind of abusive like masculine type of energy yeah, represented by David Bowie in the fantasy landscape because he's kind of manipulative in the way he talks to her. That's like, he talks about like wanting to do everything for her and like being tired of trying to meet her expectations and shit. Right. Yes. And that's totally like, that's like the way an abusive person is like, no, he's a, he's a bad love interest. Like I don't, well, it's not a love interest. It's just that discomfort is there because they use the imagery to create. They deliberately make that connection, right? But it's he's obviously like abusive and bad. Well, I want to point out: is this movie actually secretly genius? Because she, like in the park earlier, she was like writing her own story, right? Um, and making her own adventure, and then she was doing that later on when she was carrying her baby brother is the reason that this doesn't seem planned out and things just sort of happen randomly and the romance pops up at the end because she's just a teenage girl who doesn't know what she's doing <laughs> narrative wise. I that, mean, you could retcon that yeah. and that in of, uh, that in of itself could be an interesting movie that would work well. But the thing is, there's no indication. No, I know. Yeah. I was being right. I was trying to channel you and be f- yeah, facetious. Well, the and thing is though, like that idea could work for this, you know, yeah. that genuinely could be a path that you choose. But the thing is, this movie doesn't choose a path. Ironically, it gets lost in its own labyrinth. It doesn't like, it doesn't quite make it to the center. Well, you need to commit to decisions, right? And then pay them off. And the things that get paid in off in this movie are one confusing and weird. And two, the things that they really spend time focusing on do not, there's not like a continuity in a strong sense, right? You only get the continuity of structure because this is like, in the vaguest sense, because this is a journey movie and she at point one loses her brother at point two labyrinth at point three gets her brother. (laughs) Right. No point three walks in an MC Escher painting, uh, for a bit. And then point four gets her brother, I guess. Is that a painting or is that a sketch? I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know. It's an MC Escher thing. Yeah. Here she gives up her ring that we, why is this significant? I don't know. Yeah. We don't know if it's a thing like a gift from her late mother or like if you get emotional response to that, or maybe it's like 
maybe that ring was like a silly fantasy thing. Right. Well, it's not like... And she's giving it up in order to save her family. That would be representative. But we don't know anything about her or right. the significance of anything, so it doesn't we, work. Yeah, we also don't know, like... There's imagery of, like, this idea of patronage or, like, giving to somebody who requires something or needs something, but it's, like... What was her? What was the decision she was making there? And how does that reference like who she was before I mean, she made that decision? You could argue that that was like a selfless action, like rather than. But like, she still wanted information. Yeah, but like she wanted information, but like for her brother, I guess. Rather than give away Hoggle's jewels that he values so much, she's just like, okay, well, I'm the one who wants the information, so I'll give up something oh, of yeah. my own. I mean, this is just totally the problem of this movie, and it's just in every scene where she encounters something is that we have such a weird jumbled and incomplete idea of her interiority as a character. We can't make sense of like, I just give me 10 more minutes in the real world. I think this movie could have yeah. solved a lot of its problems. I got you, to know who she was. Beforehand. You don't even have to use puppets. Is that why they didn't do it? He's just like, I'm too bored to shoot this shit. People are get dumb. To the get to the puppets. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that people are dumb. It's just Jim Henson is like, well, fuck uh, that. I don't want to do that. See, I enjoy these sticks. Yeah, that's the thing. Like you could have just had them poking this giant thing with sharp sticks, but no, you have little tiny flesh monsters with sharp teeth riding (laughs) the sticks that they're poking him with. I love it. Yeah. And then the same thing is maybe you could interpret like Ludo in general as being like baby like. Yeah. And requiring the same sort of guidance that a small child might. Okay. Yeah. I can see that. Maybe. I don't know. Where are these rocks? I do love it. <laughs> this is a major problem with the Goblin King's army is that their helmets were all made too big and easily rotated around so that they would all be blinded at the slightest pressure on the helmet. Yeah. Is the the Goblin King has lost many wars to neighboring kingdoms because of that oversight. Do mm-hmm. you think there are other kingdoms, like elf kingdoms in this world? I don't know. All I know is that the moment they saw that happening, uh, Elon Musk started tweeting about how he was going to design a revolutionary new helmet that would fix all their problems. And then uh, when somebody else did it more efficiently and quicker, he harassed them on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh. <laughs> oh, God. But it doesn't come in yellow. Don't ask for yellow. I could have done it better, but you didn't. Oh, but I could have. You should <laughs> You should put, imperil yourself again so I could save you better. Yeah, did you see that thing where... <laughs> Somebody made like a fake GoFundMe page for him after that, which was like, put those kids back in the cave so I can save them. Uh, Oh, God. Ouch. Well, what do you think? You weren't going to be able to support his weight. So is she nice now? Um, Is that, that's what's going on? Well, she saw a big creature being tortured and did not become a complete psychopath and be like, eh, it probably deserves it. She saved it. So now it will be loyal to her. I guess. Yeah. I just don't understand her impetus for doing any of this. Well, and also, you since, don't, yeah, I don't understand her motivation for everything. Yeah. And it, it's going to get redundant, but that is 100% the problem in almost every one of these scenes is that they just really they just pull the rug out from under their own feet at the beginning. Yeah. I and still, you can't fix it. It is. I I still think, like all of Hansen's productions, this movie is a testament to puppetry and practical effects and falling in love with those types of things. But narratively, like even fans of this movie, you can't deny that this movie fails very spectacularly in that. Yeah. And I would I would love to hear because I Whenever I see this movie brought up, it's in reference to people who love David Bowie, it's people who love Jim Henson, or it's people who watched it as a kid and are just like, oh, I have nostalgia for this movie. But I don't see many people talking about its structure narratively, how it holds up. They're just like, oh, it's an underrated classic. I'm like, eh. Eh? There's kind of a reason it bombed and was critically panned when it came out. Um, But what are you going to do? Although I do have to say, I mean... We've been saying about this about everything, but these door yeah. knocker creatures are phenomenal. All of the, all of the little like fun characters I yeah. love. Well, it it's not merely a conception thing. It's like look at the way they look. It looks like it looks almost like uncanny valley CGI. 
because it's so like look at how smooth those well, images yeah. are well because we're just like well it's a human ma- it's like it's supposed to be a human mouth moving but it doesn't look like a human mouth but that is a real effect and it almost lo- it looks better than because it's supposed to be polished metal it looks yeah. like i know what it's you're so talking strange about. it's almost god it's like fascinatingly weird that's a good way to describe this movie honestly I don't know. I don't think it's weird enough to be well, really like that. I think Dark Crystal, you could say, is like fascinating in that way. But I don't this movie like just Dark Crystal. I don't vanilla. know why. I've never really got been able to get into Dark Crystal that well. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm like the biggest fan of that movie either. But I feel like this that movie has more virtues. You know, it it is going for something more specific. Hmm. <laughs> that's fucking mean. Yeah. Can we also mention that the things they do pay off that she learns in the labyrinth are like, what is the line she repeats specifically? Life's not fair. Yeah. And that's just the way it is. So the one thing that they really cared about with continuity for like her progression is that she like is going to treat oh, people the, like shit. Yeah. The door forgave her though. It was like, that's all right. I'm used to it. Yeah. I mean, that's also another weird thing. That's the second time she's opened a door with some sort of decision. And that decision is immediately nullified by what happens immediately after she opens the door. Yeah. First time she falls through a hole. Second time the the door knocker is just like, it's okay. That decision you made doesn't matter because I don't mind. I do like the sort of the, the truth. Yeah. And lying enigma th- yeah, paradox thing. Um, I do like that. I always sort of got the notion because she like comes up with this whole convoluted thing of just like that. And then like, they're just like, is that right? And then oh, they, they don't know. Yeah. It's like, Oh, I've never really understood this. I'm like, <laughs> okay. I mean, if the character was more clear, that'd be kind of great. That idea. Right. Yeah. And then she gets something out of it, but they're just like, Oh, I don't know. Yeah, sure. Why yeah. not? Yeah. That would be great because it would also reinforce that, you know, the idea that, that there's still always going to be a progression to be made regardless because it has something to say about everything she does in this movie. You know what I mean? And the idea of life being a spectrum and sort of a sequence of decisions that doesn't end when the movie's over. Ludo, where have you gone? Where's this fog machine coming from? I don't know. Oh my God. It's a face. It's a David Bowie rock. Why would she start screaming for Hoggle? I don't know. I don't know why she does anything in this. Yeah, <laughs> that is a very good thing. Yeah, I feel like. Oh, David Bowie's dick is here to chastise Hoggle more. That would be weird if that was the deliberate subtext of this. Yeah. Is like. <laughs> he's just going to intimidate him, but it's always with like weirdly framed shots of his like bulge. It's like, it's not even like me just being like, oh, you can see his bulge in one shot. It's front and center. Well, here's in the so thing. So many scenes. Here's the thing I, I realized watching it again this time is that I think part of the thing is when you have these small puppets that are waist high. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of like, you have to do that. You have to shoot it that way because otherwise it doesn't work. Right. And you have to have David Bowie standing there or whatever. And since he's also the bad guy, he's going to want to be like gaining height over our good characters who are smaller. So it's like there's no the situations where he's not going to be standing up and it's not going to be like right in their face mm-hmm. are, are going to be like few, right? Fewer. And here we have our Snow mm-hmm. White situation. Again, weird subtext that's kind of like uncomfortable in terms of like the perverse romantic implications, right? Where he's like, he's drugging her. That's what's going to happen, right? That's literally what's happening. Yeah. Bossom companions? Bosom. Okay. Okay. We're one for one now for mispronouncing words we should know how to pronounce. I don't understand this joke. Which one? I've never heard this one. The land of stench? Yeah, because we have the bog of eternal stench, but is there an entire land? Is it a different realm? 
Well, it's next it, to the the vineyard of stench. Oh uh, yes. Um, It's, it's just going to throw it. Okay, whatever. I don't care. I'm not going to spend too much time thinking about that. Oh, here we go. Childhood trauma, the scene. Is this your least favorite scene in the movie? Uh, Well, yeah, because I'm having flashbacks to being scared as a kid. But um, Well, you can appreciate that on its own merits Yeah, in a um, certain sense. But, I mean, it's like, in terms of everything, I feel like this might be my w- least favorite scene. Uh, well, the compositing doesn't hold up that well. I appreciate the creative drive to sure. create these things that like can Agreed. tear off their limbs and do it. Agreed. But out of all the spectacular effects in this movie, this one has held up the least and it honestly kind of feels like the least necessary. Well, you could just cut it out. Yeah. It doesn't make a difference. It doesn't add much. And you could do that with all the songs in this movie. Also, this song is, is bad. This is, is not a good song. Um, but you could do that. I think with, all the songs in this movie is you could cut them out and you don't really lose anything, which is also bad, right? Because you don't want your songs in any sort of musical type of movie to be like purely like a, a digression from the plot or character. But, uh, this scene just comes out of fucking nowhere. It feels like it exists because they had the idea. That's weird. Yeah. This feels the most like something, like you said, where he had ideas for other things that got recycled and cannibalized into this. But also, we were watching the bonus features before this started, right? And we talked about how bad the compositing is in this, right? And you know who was on set for when they were shooting this and who was talking about how they, how revolutionary it was when they were shooting the sequences. None other than George Lucas. Yeah. He was front and is center. Is this a George Lucas moment? Uh, trying to push the new digital technology. Just um, when it's not ready. Or, yeah. Well, it's not even like digital technology. Although he said we shot it with a digital camera, um, that it wasn't, wasn't digital. It was a it was a computer camera. Oh, that's what he. Because <laughs> um, that does that make sense? I, it might have in the eighties. I'm not we sure. We shot it with a computer. I can't do a, a George Lucas. We shot it with a computer camera. Thanks, Pee Wee. I'm really <laughs> glad you told us that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's he was talking about that, and uh, it just doesn't look good. I wonder if if Jim Henson would have done that without George Lucas's uh, mindless rambling input. Yeah, I guess we'll never know. But that is something that's fun to speculate about. Please get off of her. I'm, I, uh. This is just the moment where the movie just loses all steam for me. Because it's just yeah. like you've you've had a movie where it's like the at least she was moving in a direction at some point, right? Yeah. Through the labyrinth. But in everything else, it's like, even if there's not like a direct character purpose or something, they're still trying to do that. And in this, they're not even trying anymore. It no, just, she, she learns nothing. She changes not at all. And we learn nothing about the world or other characters or David Bowie or the baby or anything. It's just sort of a thing that happens and adds nothing to the plot. Yeah. And scarred me as a child, which is honestly the most important takeaway anybody should listen to is that this scene scared me as a small child. Um, right. And then Hoggle decides to save her, which yes. again, did I mention before? Did I finish mentioning my point that I feel like Hoggle's character is kind of like shortchanged? Yeah. Yeah. Just well, like make it be some sort of development that you're trying to learn. Oh, at least that's clever. The fact that their ears are flapping like that. Yeah. Well, it's like those little details that like are very hard to do with puppetry, but right. Jim Henson always does, and he does it very well. Right. Then we have this weird thing about the kissing, right? Is it just supposed to be a joke? I don't know. Well, they get sent to the Bog of Eternal Stench because of it. Well, he doesn't become the Prince of Stench. Yes, he's not. he is not declared pin- yeah, <laughs> Prince of the Land of Stench. There's lots of paperwork the involved Duke, in that. The Dukedom of Stench. Yeah. You're the fiefdom of smelliness. Um, Bog makes farting noise. That's probably the best really subtitle great. I've ever seen. I kind of don't mind how not subtle any of this is. Yeah. It's it's farting. It is kind of a horrifying idea. You'll smell bad for the rest of your life, yeah. Oh, hashtag, it's a butthole. Hashtag anus. <laughs> that should be the only hashtag you hashtag put on this anus, episode. Hashtag anus, hashtag fart, hashtag... Nobody uh, will understand why our Labyrinth episode is only tagged as hashtag anus. Um, yeah. 
No show notes, no anything. Just <laughs> hashtag anus. Yeah. Yeah. We could pair it with our uh, deep throat commentary track. Oh, that's yeah. It's coming up. Well, we've already recorded that. Right. We've, we've watched that plenty of times. Um. <gasps> What does that if mean? If I had a dollar for every time I heard Don't that. Don't pretend to be so hard. I wish somebody would tell that to David Bowie. <laughs> He's not pretending. <laughs> it's just like that. You're going to have to toss me. Do you think this movie would make for a good remake? Um, yes. And you know what? No, absolutely not. Why? Um... So narrative-wise, yes, it's the kind of movie that you should remake. A movie that kind of failed in its initial mission, but uh, still is a fan base because of that. That seems like the perfect movie for a soft reboot, right? Try to improve on some of the things the original movie actually didn't really do too well while keeping the spirit of the original. However, the only reason people have nostalgia for this movie and enjoy it is because of two people who are now dead, unfortunately, which is Jim Henson and David Bowie. So I don't think you can really recapture that magic and... I knowing Hollywood is today, they would do a lot of it with CG, right? Um, which would kind of lose the spirit of the original. So, what's the point of doing that? Yes, and also you would probably have a digitally inserted David Bowie, which might have me die. What? So I don't know. They would definitely do that. They would have something like that, like a flashback to the Goblin King, or just like have him deposed at the beginning, or something like that. They would definitely do that. I don't put it past Hollywood. Unless David Bowie has somewhere written in his will that nobody's allowed to use his likeness for things. Which is sad that we have to have people do that now. I like this character. Yeah, he's fun. He's fun. He's the most charismatic probably out of the companions. I'm just running out of things to say about the movie. Because it's just like, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> Well, no, it's fine. Like, we've made our point about this, and, like, the rest of the movie kind of just keeps adding on to the fact that it doesn't do it, and it just kind of loses itself for a while. So it is going to be us talking about good things and scenes and bad things and scenes now. Yeah. I guess another sort of disappointing fact is that I'm just thinking of the writing team on this, right? Yes. I could understand it being jumbled if you have so many people with their, like, you know... If you have too many cooks in the kitchen you will wind up with something that is kind of strange and characteristic of none of them, right? But, like, even though this movie feels that way, I don't feel like there's any cleverness in a lot of this stuff anyway. Where it's like, you have writers who are, like, people like Terry Jones or Elaine May, well, right? just bludgeoned him to death with this thing right now. This children's movie took a drastic turn. I wonder, hmm, how would I feel about that? I don't know. Also, he has like a much more realistic tongue than I remember, and it's kind of disturbing me. Who? Didymus? Yeah. Yeah. I kind of, I enjoy this interaction that they're now going to be fighting, and then they have like their, their like valiant knight moment, which again, I'm thinking about Terry Jones and the writing team because of this, because it's reminiscent of uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail to me, right? Where he has to stop them in their progress, right? Where... I don't know. It seems like a similar idea. But again, there's no cleverness from any of those people that I can detect in this where I feel like there should be because they're all very talented uh, filmmakers in their own right. Yes. But anyway, I like I like that interaction. It's just it's weird because it because we don't know anything about the characters to begin with or there's nothing about them that has been really established. I kind of like don't really it doesn't like add anything to the story. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. Well, we have her solving a problem with logic again, which would be good if she was illogical before the movie or we had a build up to this. But I guess it's supposed to be just a thing for growing up. You know what? That's a good point. I think yeah. this is a fairly decent representation of that idea of like a cognitive progression, right? Where again, to compare it to Alice, you sort of start with situations where she takes in information from her, what's going on around her and makes just like strange childish decisions, right? Which can be yeah. expected from a child. She's falling down the hole, right? And then she grabs that jar that is labeled empty. And she's like, what? <laughs> and then she opens it and it's empty, <laughs> right? So it's like, it's 
it's it's using like logic and reasoning, right? And that's sort of the way that story works and what makes it, you know. Tick, I love how Hawkle right? just keeps running off and then like. Yeah, he's, he's but- so capricious and like not helpful. He can't decide to be helpful or just shitty. Anyway, that idea of like just asking if we can, if we have permission to continue is like a, a neat idea in terms of capitalizing on like. This is a fun thing things. that they bring back though. The rock stuff. Well, yeah, because he was when he was crying before the tiny little rocks were rolling up right. to her, right? And she used them to save him, but now he can use it to help save her. Yeah, I that's mean, that's narratively it's, good. I mean, I don't know if it's narratively good. Okay. It's consistent. Yes. Okay. That's sorry. Consistent is a much better word. I for mean, it. I like the idea. Is the thing. I think it's fun, but it's like, if we're really gonna think about it. It's kind of it still comes out of nowhere because there's no precedent to it aside from that. You know what I mean? There's no other what are the rules of this fantasy universe? Also, I just want to go out of my way to mention how impressive impressive it is that somebody in this giant outfit was able to walk across these rocks. Especially since some of them still come up yeah. while he's walking. Although clearly, not to nitpick too much, but clearly uh those rocks are wet. And those are his feet. He can't take yeah. those feet off. He's gonna. His feet are gonna stink for the rest of his existence. Yeah, that's a bit of a nitpicky thing, but yeah, that is true. Yeah. Um, Here we have another sort of Alice what a, reference. What a good dog. What a very good dog. Yeah, but it's much like Alice continually uh, referencing her cat. Get the dog yeah. repeated here. The dog. You get some funny, clever stuff later where the dog literally flees from the battle and hides behind a door and locks it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's funny. So is Jareth just omnipotent in this place? I guess. I don't know. There's not like, this is what we're saying though, is that there's not like very clear rules. There's no like society or anything. Yeah, this world does not feel lived in. Whereas Wizard of Oz, as fantastical and like artificial as that world feels when you go into Oz... Well, yeah, but like the Munchkin village, like you feel like you you, you, want, you recognize a society. Yeah, there's a yeah. society that you could theoretically see people living there. Like, there's yeah, guilds the, of all kinds. Yes, mainly for candy, um, for lollipops. Yes, <laughs> but um, there's like the roads lead to different places. You have different people in different areas. Like, I believe that that place exists. Kind of people have lives in that world that existed before Dorothy yeah. arrived. Yes, like whereas the goblins, like they. What do they do when they're not watching a girl try to make her way through the labyrinth? Right. What does David Bowie do? Apparently master juggling. Does he have does he have like he does is he a lord over like citizens in this realm? Does he go to war with people? Yeah, that's what I was saying. Is there like an elf kingdom next door? Yeah. I, I don't know. You could say you could make the argument that this movie isn't about any of that, which it isn't, right? But you don't have to make the movie about that to give us a clearer idea of like the circumstances that she's in, you know? And I think the the real point of all of this is that we wouldn't be having these questions if the movie more clearly established the parameters of her journey and her character in the first place. True. We might wonder it, but we wouldn't feel like we wouldn't be asking the movie to answer some sort of question about that. Do you think if we had more information? Do you think it would have been better if they had like cast Helena Bonham Carter or Laura Dern for this role? Or I don't know. I don't know if you would say it's better or simply just like different. Because I don't know what you can do with that character. That right? is true. But because it seems like it's not simply her. It's like the story has no idea what her mental state is from scene to scene. You know what I'm. You know what I mean? There are moments in which she has to make a decision where literally it's almost like for a brief second, you see her like being like cognizant of something and then being like, Oh, this is the right answer. Right. But that's the only like character moment in in terms of her interiority. Otherwise she's just like, what is this? What is that? She's totally passive. And by the way, this is the most, uh, speaking of wizard of Oz, but anyway, by the way, she doesn't react to this fantasy world whatsoever. No, she just, just takes it right in stride. He's like, yep, this is what happened. This is what's happening. Okay, cool. The moment she fucking sees David Bowie, she's like, wait, yep. are you the Goblin King? Yeah. He's like, of course I am. 
Who else would I be? David Bowie. Who's he? <laughs> I love how they're just noticing that Hoggle drugged and yeah. Again, similar to Wizard of Oz, not only in terms of just the bubble imagery, but the fact that they're being put to sleep, that yes. she's being put to sleep. Puppies. Although, again, Puppies. this is this is more creepy because again, he drugged her. And you have the weird romance thing, and then... Yeah, then we're at the Eyes Wide Shut party now. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God, look at this, though. Somewhere in this room, Tom Cruise is... Tom Cruising it up. (laughs) (laughs) Climbing on a wall somewhere. I'm going to be honest, I've never seen Eyes Wide Shut all the way through. Eyes Wide Shut is a great movie. I've heard that. I've just never finished it. Um, I wonder which one is David Bowie. There he is. You know, I think I heard that George Lucas has a cameo in this sequence. He's one of the guests. I believe he's... No, I believe you're confusing that uh, with an earlier scene. He was actually one of the goblins. Oh, um, uh, okay. They didn't even need to put makeup on him. He just showed up one day, and he looked like that. Someone's got a cameo in this, though. Well, I'm assuming that like a lot of these people are just like production people. Well, you're in this actress. sequence. Yes. Um, I was the snake that just popped up that box. Cool. That was an earlier role I did. Um, I when was also, did you transition out of snake roles into just... Well, no, because this was a big movie for me because I was the snake in that box. I was the snake in the beginning when David Bowie threw. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, it was like your nutty professor, kind of. Yes. Um, or and, Norbit. And after that, I I was an extra on Snakes on a Plane. Um, I was one of the snakes on set plane. You were on set that day where... Sam Jackson started screaming about those Monday to Friday snakes. Yes, actually. Um, I was personally offended. I was, and now it was called me a monkey eating <laughs> snake on this Monday to Friday plane. Yeah, that was very offensive. I didn't like that. No, no, monkey fighting, I believe. Monkey fighting? Yes. I thought like it was monkey eating. I don't <laughs> monkey know. Monkey fighting. Apparently, that was the original line in the script. Was this is a. Uh, monkey fighting. That's not fucking possible. No, apparently it was. Apparently, like, the movie was even, like, it was just gonna go, going to be bad, bad. <sighs> but it was kind of saved by the fact. Hey, is he wearing a bolo tie? Maybe He's... we should get off cr- the plane. <laughs> I'm fine with talking about snakes on a plane. This scene always bored me. Like, yeah. It, it doesn't do Despite anything. how creepy it is, it's just kind of dull. Yeah. Um, And, like, maybe. Despite his bedazzled Listen. coat. We've all dreamt about dancing with David Bowie singing to us romantically. It's a universal thing. But this is a very, like like you said, this is fantastical. This has all the things I love. It has creepy, weird masquerade things. It has dreamlike sequences. It has wonderful costume design. It has David fucking Bowie. It has his music. And yet this scene is boring and dull to me, and I have no idea why. It's well, it's just, it's so many fades, and it, you've already you're already in the malaise of not understanding the consequences of any scene that happens you know what yeah. i mean and not understanding what anything what the significance of every plot point is although i think her hair looks really nice in this no the costume and set design is wonderful yeah. in this point um but the idea in abstract is creepy and works it's just i think it's cuz also all the shots in that were like the ones that weren't close ups were all just kind of flat POV. and boring yeah <laughs> what if they all just died instantly? <laughs> Everyone dies. There's like, what is happening right now? Uh, like, what did just what just happened to her? She was sucked into a fantasy world so Bowie could distract her more so she wouldn't get to the end of the labyrinth. And how did Hoggle get here? And where are we now? She'll never forgive me. She you she's dead for all you know. And and after she smashed the thing with the chair. Why did it deposit her here instead of where she fell asleep? Why anything? Was it a dream at all or was it she got transported? And now she has a thing where she can't remember what happened beforehand, kind of. And then she stops that. I don't know. I don't want to continuously nitpick this, but it's like it's hard to find things. Ew, that's gross. It's hard to find things to continually to like comment upon when you're so confused about what is going on. Although I like this woman. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just like, also like all the side, little side characters, like 
I, I actually want to know their stories more than I want to know hers. Right. Um, oh, look, there's more of them. Yeah. I didn't even see that. But yeah. Well, yeah, and they start offering her different things. A lot. Well, here we get... Essentially it, what this moment is, right, is the... It's not quite lowest point per se, but it's like... In the narrative, this is like a Lotus Eater's moment where like if you think of it in those terms, she's going to like indulge in what is easy and forget. Right. Well that, and also like it's junk. All of this is junk. I right. think is supposed to be what this is supposed to be. Slashing machine. Well, that's literally what she says. Was that too. in there before? Cause that's slashing the, machine. That's the drill that she had to run away from. Really? Before. Yeah. Oh, I didn't, I didn't see that. I saw judge dread <laughs> and I have not seen judge dread in this labyrinth yet. <laughs> he just shows up and starts killing all the goblins. <laughs> Sylvester Stallone. Um, yeah, that's a drawing. That's a painting, a sketch. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, again, this idea as a story point works. It's just, how did we get here? Where are we going from here? Why do I care? Well, and also, I don't like the idea that like all of this stuff is junk. Yeah, that too. It's important to her. Well, yeah, it's just the same point that was made earlier that the movie is reinforcing where it's like this fantasy stuff is useless, right? Yeah. But also that's the landscape through which she's exercising these issues and dealing with them. So it's like, well, movie, you're proving that you're what you're saying right now is wrong by the fact of yourself existing. If this was useless, why is this a movie about a labyrinth? Uh, yeah. Just like, call it reality. For or a something. movie that loves its fantasy and wants to indulge in a childlike fantasy, it spends a lot of time just shitting on that. Shitting on it and talking about how you should grow up out of it. Yeah, instead of looking at at the idea of like, I don't know, how it interacts with the real world. I guess the movie just doesn't seem really aware of that, you know? But also when you start the movie that way, you can't get out of out of that premise, you know what I mean? Where it's like that dichotomy and all the stuff it references is about that too. Right. And it ends sort of aware of that, but it doesn't, it doesn't really sort of say anything about it along the way. I mean, uh, in a different context, I like the idea of the fact that this like junk lady is slowly turning her into one of them. Oh yeah. I didn't even notice that the yeah. interesting visual stuff where she's putting it on her back. Yeah. It tells you a lot about all these other junk people. Yeah, maybe, area. maybe they're people who have failed to solve the labyrinth and have been trapped here ever since by their yeah, own desires. Yeah, they've just been like accumulating objects from their past, right? See, that's what I'm saying. I like the side characters. It's almost like the Citizen Kane idea, right? Yeah. With Xanadu being cluttered with shit and he's still just looking for like Rosebud or whatever. But... The thing is like she doesn't solve this issue in any way that at all takes advantage of like the idea of what fantasy is. You know what I mean? And again, to go back of comparing this to maybe inception, it's like they don't solve their issues in inception by doing like crazy dream shit to change the reality of the world. Yeah. They don't interact with the world. You know what I mean? They just move through it to try to get to their goal and do normal things. And we have like, cause you have like, you see all these things were stuffed animals before, like it's her actual dog. She had these different things, but like, I wish she interacted with them in an emotional way in the real world and then like developed that. Yeah, you pay that world. off. It's just, yeah. and furthermore you paid off. We, st we already have a trend for her controlling the narrative of this story because she recites it, you know, before all this starts right to herself in the mirror. Why does she not exercise that same sort of agency over the story throughout the rest of the movie? You know what I mean? Not necessarily in terms that are as literal as reciting the story, but why can she not manipulate and control the fabric of this fantasy world somehow? Why does she not have like special powers well, or something? I guess that's what we're supposed to say at the end. I don't know. Cause she is talking about like, yeah, like my power is as great as yours and my kingdom just as great. But beginning. what does that mean? Well, no, it's because it's the fantasy world of her creation. But yeah, like, I mean, it would undermine the point of the movie if she could just instantly be like, oh, well, this is my world, so I can create a path right through the sure. labyrinth. But, but then you figure out a way to cleverly work that into a character arc yes. or some sort of progression. You don't break the 
you know, the stakes of the story by making her that would be good. Like Have a her god, like but... learn to channel her creativity into like writing or just something yes. like that. Also, like... something that Kubo does better than this movie. Yes, right. Where, which is why I thoroughly enjoy Kubo, and I only right. They rely on the same narrative device of the Miz on a beam sort of yeah. right where you have the story within the story that's identical to the actual story. But like, this is really impressive by the way. All of this, I is love this really impressive. Like that's what I love about it. Like yeah. that's what saves this movie at all. Like if this was just a, what's worth watching about it, yeah. I don't think it saves it, but I understand what you, you're saying. Yeah. But like if this was just a movie with David Bowie and a girl being lost in imagination land, like it might, be something I would never want to watch again, but like, I love that, uh, Ambrosius rears like a horse. Yes. And also like <laughs> those rubber suddenly spikes. Turns, yeah. Suddenly turns into a bad stuffed animal for a second. Um, and then makes those spikes rubber. <laughs> oh my God. For some reason, I kind of enjoy how bad that puppet is. <laughs> no, it's fun. And if you want to add goofy expressions on the dog, that's probably the best way to do it. But yeah, Hoggle, you drugged me. Oh, man. Talk about Kubo and the Two Strings. Yeah. Seeing some weird parallels now. They were... Well, hey, the baby works at Leica. That's true. Maybe he was just like, hey, listen, I was in this movie as a baby once. I should do things from that. But you know what? Again, the thing that Kubo does better than this is it, it very much focuses on the idea of Kubo using expressive power as like a, a type of magical conduit. Yes. Right? For his own sort of character or agency or interiority, right? He channels what is inside him into the yes. actual world. And also he does that with multiple things. First it's creativity and then it's his kindness and like loyalty to his family. Whereas this she does that with Yeah, and he addresses nothing. his problems by doing that. Right? Whereas yeah. her, she just moves she just like she just walks along <laughs> She just walks. She'll she get just there keeps eventually. walking. She doesn't have any special powers like that. And even their biggest challenge with this giant ogre, machine ogre, it's just like she just watches, right? Hoggle was the only one that was effective in that. And I yeah. don't care because I don't know anything about Hoggle other than the fact that he can't make up his own damn mind. <laughs> and if Jareth is really omnipotent, why is he not yelling at him for telling her the, uh, whatever I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to stop questioning the logic of a movie that clearly stopped caring about having it a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, all the, all the plot points of this movie are very, are very sort of perfunctory in that way. They're contrived, you know, it doesn't make sense, but the movie's only like, it's not awful because again, you still have this amazing Jim Henson stuff. Yeah. But you can't really, you can't really uh, sort of trump all this stuff, you know? It's hard to, like, it's hard for, the, oh, wow, Ludo has, a like, a thick ass. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that? That is literally the last thing I was expecting Did to you hear see you that, say though? during this commentary. <laughs> look, look, he is. <laughs> is If you had told me today, it's just like, yeah. <laughs> During your labyrinth commentary, <laughs> look at it. Though. Austin's gonna be like, "Yo, Ludo, it. thick." <laughs> he is. Look, look. Tell me I'm wrong. I'm not. You think Jim Henson was thinking that? No, I don't think anybody was thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Ringing a bell in a room full of people that already know. Yeah. Whatever. I think this sequence is exciting. Ooh, more chickens. What is with the chickens? The chickens are deep symbolism. They represent... Do they uh, just have a lot of chickens on them? She starts off with as an egg, and then she hatches into a full-born chicken by the end of the movie. Oh. Well, which came first? Uh, well, actually an egg. I have a definitive answer to that. But... Also Aww. in this sequence, I really enjoyed the fact that just these goblins have like guns. Yes. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, we saw the making of for the little goblins on the... <laughs> and their legs keep getting fucked up. Yeah, the legs kept going on backwards and whatnot. See, this is now suddenly exciting because 
you don't expect the battle at the end to have like actual physical carnage where they're blowing shit up. No. And this gets back to what is effective about Dark Crystal, I think, which is just literally making a movie that is all puppets and having things you would expect from a live action movie in it. Right. And then you're like, oh, that's neat to see with just puppets. Right. Yes. It's neat to see a chase through alleyways with puppets. With goblins riding weird lizard creatures. And fucking chickens everywhere. Do you think that's reference in Kubo, the fire chicken? To Um, all the goddamn chickens in this movie? I don't know. Why? All I can say is that every... chicken gate. Why is there so many chickens? Every chicken in Hollywood worked. Yes. Every single one. Now, Max, do you have a favorite set piece or sort of like character or an idea of a character that is sort of one of those details that you appreciate most Um, about this? That's great. Um, That is great. That's the thing, though. Like, I don't have any particular favorite one. I just, I really appreciate when things that they didn't need to do, like... um, Just go out of their way to do it. Stuff like that cannonball. Yes, exactly like that cannonball, where, like, things that didn't need to have character. Like, I would have been impressed enough if you had little puppet goblins firing a cannon, but you chose to make that cannon have a weird goblin baby inside of it and say something Mm -hmm. funny after it shot. I (laughs) love that. I also love, like, the little things on sticks. Like, anything that you went the extra mile for... That adds flavor. That adds fun to the movie. And i that's what I really end up appreciating about this at the end of the day. Yeah. I think I agree with that mostly because it adds a texture that I think is more pervasive than any single character. <laughs> yeah. I just love that Ambro just locks the door. The dog locks the it's door. It's just so funny. But also, I'm going to say, after you mentioning that detail about the trash people and how yes. that works, I'm going to say I like that idea a lot, you know? And almost that sounds like that place should have just been the oubliette, right? Because yeah. that seems so, so why not combine them? I don't know. I really like that idea. That's like an interesting character and an interesting like concept in terms of the character's behavior, right? I think Ludo has a really interesting uh character concept where he has the rocks, right? Yes, he's an but it's bender. like but also that's kind of more random, you know? It's still fun. Yeah. But it's not there's not that like uh, I don't know. It's not like commenting on its on its own idea as an image in in function as well. We're gonna have the rocks. Is that macaroni? Wow. Yes, we're gonna have the rocks rise up and take back their rightful place in the Goblin Kingdom. <laughs> the proletariat rock rising. <laughs> the rocks have been under the feet of goblins for too long. Oh literally. My God, can you imagine just sequences filmed like that where they're like in a mine and there's just rocks Ow. with like chains Ow. around them. Oh, <laughs> as they get mine they're sitting there, yeah. they're just like whipping a rock over and over again. <laughs> it's not moving. Hurry the fuck up, rocks. Dun dun dun. <laughs> the rocks open the doors too. <laughs> yeah. They're really, who needs thumbs in this universe, honestly? Yeah. Oh, they even had one of them fall off. Look at that. That's actually impressive considering how those little things were made. Yep, they put lots of effort into this. That's like that's why I'll watch this movie again in the future. Yeah, look at his staff. It's got a goblin face. Yeah. That talks and says good grief. And so, like you have that fucking spider right there crawling down the wall. Why? Yeah. Uh, you didn't need that. <gasps> They just hit one of those chickens with the yeah. boulder. Good. We need less chickens in this movie. That's great. I love these practical stunts. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> oh, their little guns had little things in them. That was cute. So many things are cute. So has yeah. he just been watching or? Yeah, he doesn't want to do anything. Um, also, while we see his, st- we saw his staff real quick. They designed it as a crystal thing, but they also designed it to be reminiscent of a microphone because yet again, he's supposed yeah, to okay. represent. Oh, I like that guy. Look yeah. at how cool that is. They're just blowing up this fake set. I guess I always like that too because I know how much effort goes into these yes, sets. Yes, exactly. As somebody who, like, if you're anybody who appreciates any kind of 
production design or set design, like you have to admire the movie for that. Well, it's like if you ever get a sequence that's worthy of the destruction of the set and then you actually do it, you nail it. It's like somehow you're immortalizing the set because you're also destroying it. You know, it has this interesting, like that type of imagery has like an interesting, like emphasis and power behind it. Hoggle kind of stepped over that goblin's line. Like if the goblin had gotten hit by the rock, after saying, now we have you, and then he was just like, oh, now we don't. Like, I think that would have worked better. But what are you going to do? I'm not George Lucas. I didn't write this movie. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You just splattered that goblin. Oh, <laughs> what a good dog. I'm going to say that every time. <laughs> God damn it, Austin. Look, they left milk outside the door. Oh, There's yeah. a milkman in this universe. Yes, he comes to the castle, you know. Well, that's interesting. That's fun. There's another chicken. Christ. <laughs> we should do Cock another... a doodle Christ. We should do another watching of this movie and take a shot every time we see a chicken. Fucking die halfway through. And yeah. then the commentary would just be like an hour of silence. Yes. I don't know who would end the show and post it. It'll be we our, definitely die. It will so. be our, in our last will and testament. And it's just like, please post this unedited. We send it to our one loyal listener, yes. Neil Gaiman. How did that joke happen? That's uh, such an awful joke. Um, I'm going to blame it on you. No. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's where most of our awful continuous jokes come from me. Um, I believe I brought him up talking about something and... Then we made a joke about how funny it would be if he was our listener. And he's like, you were like, oh, if he is, then he's one of our estranged fathers. Well, that and that uh, was not the first time we brought it up. Well, uh, no, we were uh, we brought it up during uh, Kubo and the Two Strings because he no, because we were talking about uh, Princess Mononoke. That wasn't even the first time we brought it up. OK, we talked about Neil Gaiman a lot. We like him. I've like barely read any Neil Gaiman. <laughs> I'm, but he seems like a fun guy. I like sure. Sandman. I like Good Omens is fucking wonderful i hey, love that jim henson is directing this movie now yes look at this we finally throw in some shadows all over the place no more flat lighting and we're just gonna get david bowie jumping off of walls and shit yeah and like <sighs> if the movie was consistently stuff that is visually as weird as this i think i would appreciate it a little oh, bit but more. look at that yeah and like that was obviously a mannequin when he was doing that but like it flew seamlessly right. back into actual David Bowie. Right. And I wonder even like, I know you have to do a lot of sophisticated set and camera planning in order to make stuff like this work. But like, if you were able to do something that is this visually inventive for the things that have a lot of puppetry and everything, maybe it would distract from the puppetry, but it's like, I feel like it might be easier to get away with things looking a certain way. I don't know. Well, at least like, and you can do this in conjunction with the puppetry. Right. Like, Why not do both and just create the weirdest experience ever? Just this kaleidoscopic, like. Then I would understand why people hold yeah. this movie so dear rather than just like, okay, yeah. that was pretty fun. You um, know what would be, would be cool is if um, David Bowie was using his magic to somehow like transmogrify the terrain while they were fighting the goblins. Yeah. And this, like, it was becoming this as they were fighting. And by the time they defeated the goblins, it had become the MC Escher. Well, yeah, because he can control the labyrinth, right? Right. And have him have him be more involved because he just sort of sits back and is just like, yeah, this yeah. will work out. Eventually. You know, as much as Jen, uh, Jennifer Connelly does not have like agency or powers within this fantasy world, yeah. he doesn't have agency or powers either. He just has like he kind of appears a drug like, peach. Yeah, a drug peach and some balls that can summon things when he throws them. Um, yeah, that turn into bubbles. Bubbles or death drill or whatever it was called. <laughs> Toby. So what do you think this movie ends up being focused on? That's a good Just question. Just at the end of the day. What is its primary goal? Aside from the puppetry, I mean in terms of story. Because clearly the puppetry is front and center. I guess like it's, a, I think it's supposed to be just a general thing of growing up, but it fails at that spectacularly. I don't, it doesn't have a clear narrative and that kind of baffles me that like, yeah. And more it's more premise. Like it's such a strain. No, but I think it does have a clear premise. 
and that's the weird thing about it is that the idea of what you feel like they're going for seems so clear, right? And you just see them con- continually like make strange decisions to try to get to that place, right? Yeah. And you just lose track of what's going on along the way because it doesn't add up to anything. <sighs> what a beautiful man. Ugh. Look at that dick. See, this is totally like abusive. Yeah. Abusive like language that he's using. Also, I think he would help if he looked creepier by the ending. Yes. You know, have his like outfit slowly get more and more like, yeah, have him start off very like dreamlike and just like, Ooh, but then like have him get more and more. Malicious. I know it is obvious because they tried to cast David Bowie, I think originally for this role. No, well, but actually, he's got to look a little bit like Zool. I didn't bring that up because I brought up the casting things. They were considering a bunch of other people. Yeah. Besides, famously but, Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson's most famous one. Uh, sting was also considered, um, right. So I'm kind of glad they didn't go with, um, I know both of us both think that the ideal person for this role, even more so than David Bowie, is uh, is Tim Curry. But if it has to be a, a musician, yeah, then David Bowie is pretty solid. I've liked him in a number of other movies. Man Who Fell to Earth, Last Temptation of Christ. Yes. Can be a solid actor. I don't know about Michael Jackson. I enjoy the Thriller video. <laughs> but I don't know about much else. And then I, what, what's with Sting? He's in Dune, which I haven't seen. I, I still want to watch Dune. Uh, I know it's a lot of shit, but like, I kind of, I need to see it. Like, sure. I don't know. I think it has some sort of weird resurgence online where people actually like really Ooh. enjoy talking about it. But it's like notes, uh, Rod's, Rod Stewart, uh, Freddie Mercury and uh, Prince were also considered for the role. Freddie Mercury. Yes. Would he have kept the mustache? I don't know. Maybe that's why it's like, oh, he won't shave for this movie. Hmm. But yeah, I think... I could see Prince. <laughs> God, could I see Prince doing this? Well, if it was Prince, Prince would have turned it into an ego project for him and it would have focused much more on him. Well, but you know what? I feel like it would have been... I love Prince. That would have added a different ingredient to it that if somehow that could coexist with, with this being a Jim Henson yeah. vehicle... Uh, I feel like that would maybe make it more interesting. Oh, look at that owl. It's even better than the owl in the beginning. Whoa! It's even worse composited than the weird head creatures. The fireies, were they called? I don't know. Mm. I don't even care anymore. Although I feel like I saw those specific creatures, now that I think about it. Were those referenced in Monsters, Inc.? I feel like I recall... An, a monster that looks exactly like those. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody in the animation department snuck in a background character that looked like. Yeah, that. I mean that movie references. Yeah, other movies, but. Uh, well, yeah, Harryhausen gets a specific call out in that. That's true. Uh, Even the title sequence. Yeah, but uh, yeah, everything is back, back to normal as it should be. Yes, and she gives up Lance Lot to. To to Toby. But here's the real question is like, we can now contrast this ending with the mirror image at the start of the movie, right? And because again, we have no idea what to expect or what's going on at the start of the movie, this just has no weight. Yeah. Because we don't really get a sense for what's normal in the house. She's just calmed down. Yeah. Is all that happened. She had like a fantasy. She like had a thing in her mind for a bit and she's like, Mm -hmm. okay, I'm calm now. And she still has all the... I want that Jareth statue. Holy shit. The one... St- <laughs> Look the, at that. The only thing she does is put the playbill of like David Bowie and her mom or whatever, the photo of it, in the drawer. That's all she does. But at least that's also a little bit visually inventive. Yes. Again, I feel like it would have been clever if they introduced David Bowie that way in the first place. Like, this could have had a great impact, but it doesn't. Why does she need... Ah, uh, whatever. I'm not going to fucking talk about it. Yeah. She needs friends. 
Are these supposed to be pictures of her and her like original mother? Because that adds like a yes. very sad yes. connotation. Yeah. It. And it's the same thing at the beginning of the movie. They just skate right over it. I know they want it to be subtext, but you have to tell us more about the character in the first place. Yeah, which maybe would make me understand why she hates her stepmom. Her stepmom is strict and like kind of annoying, but like... Is she? Not... I, she just seems fine. Just because Jennifer Connelly just... I don't know. No, she's strict, but she's not unreasonable or mean. She's just like, yeah... I don't even think she's strict. She's just like, hey, we're going out. We can't leave the baby alone. Yeah. It's not like strict. That's just like, hey, that's how it goes. Yeah. But you also pointed out something really kind of bizarre about the way this ends, too. I know they have the the ending that sort of doesn't really reconcile one one sort of uh one sort of solution for this, right? It can't come down on one side of reality versus fantasy, right? The fantasy lives on in a certain sense, but it's still changed. Yeah. Right? It doesn't settle the question of, you know, which she has to commit to. But here's the thing. Okay. There's no, like, she says, oh, I need you guys just sometimes, right? But then she just ends up dancing with them, right? And you pointed out during, when we were preparing during the preview screening, that that sort of visually to end that way is kind of like, a super cop out because she's literally just doing the same thing she would have been doing regardless. Yeah. Like if she didn't have to take care of Toby, she would just be in her own mind hanging out with the fantasy friends in the fantasy world off in the park or whatever. Right? Yes. That's exactly what she would have been doing anyway. Well, and it's, it's, if we're talking about the themes of reality versus fantasy, it's a complete, cop out for her just like having to grow up it's like well no she doesn't she didn't change at all she just stopped being a dick to her baby brother literally she just calmed down and watched the baby so (sighs) i don't know i it's a tough movie to sort of square away because it has so many interesting things and i think more so than what it accomplishes it has a lot of interesting promises of what it could accomplish yeah but it doesn't capitalize on any of it or it doesn't capitalize on a lot of it. And the things it does focus on are kind of not as important to making a movie that works. Yeah, but as far as movies that fail go... It's fine, yeah. It's a pretty good movie that fails, um, which is kind of mean, and I don't... <sighs> but also that's not the same thing as it's saying it's a good, bad movie. No, because it's not... Because I think we both would enjoy this movie better if it had some sort of weird sense of camp yeah, that it doesn't but have, it you does, know? It has charm, which is worse, almost, because, like, charm followed by nothing yeah. is much worse. It feels like an empty... Because you're just like, yeah. oh, but you had it, and then it lets yes. you go. Whereas yeah. camp, you're just like, ah, you accidentally stumbled into doing something fun. Right. So you're not expecting a lot from the rest of the movie. Whereas if you accidentally stumble, not accidentally, but if you have charm in your movie and the movie starts to dip, then it kind of feels more hollow. It feels like a missed opportunity. Yes. Which this movie is. Yeah. It is a missed opportunity. It's Jim Henson's last movie. (sighs) Right. Well, he was heartbroken by the failure of this. I remember he like, because he had said he had put a, well, he was used to people loving everything he did and he did pour his heart and soul into this movie and it kind of just failed, which is sad, but well, I'm sorry. I'm even more sorry to hear that because it's also like, yeah, it's not that great. I understand why it's a cult movie for sure. Now, no, it's definitely, it. yeah. All you people talking about the sophisticated use of symbolism and stuff like that. I've got to knock it off. Yeah. Like, listen, it's okay to like things that aren't, that don't objectively hold up. Well, right. I trust me. I know. I, watch things from my childhood that are objectively terrible and silly and made to sell toys, but I still go back and revisit them because I like them. They're fun. Right. Save your energy with that shit for like last year at Marion bad or whatever. Save it for a movie that actually prompts that type of discussion, regardless of whether or not you think it's actually worth it to engage with things in that yeah. way. There are movies that encourage that and some that don't. We I, mentioned Blue Velvet already. Yeah. David Lynch is constantly brought up as somebody who is makes very labyrinthine, complex, sophisticated films, right? Uh, I mean, that's a whole other conversation about how his movies operate and whether or not they actually behave that way, regardless of how good you think they are. But certain movies are going to demand that type of uh, sort of examination, and this one doesn't. I think it feels sort of uh, unfortunate for me because I feel like it could, like you said, it's, 
it's kind of an empty promise. Oh yeah, I forgot. He uh, had to acknowledge uh, Marie Sendak because Marie Sendak got word of the plot of this and said it was like dangerously close to one of his books. So I think I read that too. Yeah. Um, what is? Uh, let me try to remember the name. Marie Sendak, for all our listeners who don't know, is the author of acclaimed children's oh, book. Know this. I, okay. Where the wild we'll explain it are. to them. Yeah. Just make sure to insult them if they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I always do. I know. Uh, well, yeah, that was Labyrinth. Um, Outside over there, by the way, is that the name? I feel like that's the name. Yeah, I believe so. And if that's incorrect, you can insult me for not knowing. Please do. I would enjoy that greatly. But yeah, that was Labyrinth. Um, not the greatest movie. Um, populated with wonderful things. Uh, the puppetry, the little worlds, the little touches, David Bowie. Other than that, it kind of fails to deliver narratively fulfillingly and have good acting um yeah i don't know i don't know what it is about i think the fact that the charming moments of this movie are so charming to me and i'm too much of a fan of david bowie that i feel bad criticizing this movie which i normally don't do i like bashing movies but i i don't it feels mean-spirited to trash on this movie too much even though we've been doing it for the last I mean hour it and is half. trying really hard at a lot of things. Yes. Yeah, it's just I think it's so it feels so much like a first draft in terms of how it's organized. Yes. That it's hard to it sort of places an obstacle in your way of enjoying that stuff. You know, yeah. I don't want to watch this movie. I want to watch scenes from this movie. Yes, that's a great way to yeah. put it. And I or I want to watch a clip of it on YouTube, right? Cuz that's the thing that is more worthwhile than actually sitting through the duration of the film, right? When you have a movie that's like feature length, it's like... I will watch Dance Magic on YouTube. I will listen to that on Spotify if it's available, but like... Dance Magic, yes. Yes. Um, Dance Magic, yeah. That's that's the song, right? Or I'm sorry, is it Magic Jump? Um, no, it's called Make the Baby Bleed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what it's really called, Max? Magic Dance. Um, no, but, no, 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 no. Oh, God. You know what it is. Ooh, ah, 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 it is. Let the bodies hit the floor. Down with the sickness. Um, let the bodies hit the floor is almost what the song called if he let the baby <laughs> fall let when he threw it Let the baby up. hit the floor. <laughs> have you heard, have you seen that tweet? It's just like, what if uh, it's raining men and let the bodies hit the floor are the same song from a different person's perspective? <laughs> That's true. But yeah, okay, this has been Labyrinth. As you can see, I think we're pretty much out of things to uh, say. I'm just double-checking one last time. Do I have anything else to say about this movie? I think if it's not really coming naturally, I think we're probably out of it, and I think our listeners are probably are too. Yeah, so I don't know. It's a weirdly tiring movie to watch, but you can be excited for more adventures from the Spectator Film Podcast. Hashtag uh, David Bowie. <laughs> That's the only one wearing. <laughs> Hashtag <laughs> anus, you're right. Well, um, we should throw some other, you know, hashtag bulge, hashtag. This is yeah. going to be the weirdest, yeah. most sexual, weirdly episode ever. Yes. Um, oh, here's the one thing we didn't mention. Just acknowledging the fact that, like, David Bowie had sex with 15-year-old groupies. Also adding a layer of dif- discomfort. Just for me, personally. I just wanted to get that out and uh, sort of acknowledge that that that's, exists. Yeah. There's controversy. I can send you some like I know articles. I've read yeah. stuff about it and there's also controversy. There's one that definitely happened, but there's also debate over whether David actually knew she was 15 or not. Um, right. Well, either way, just another example of like another weird component of this movie. I was that trying to literally make it through the entire podcast without you bringing that up, but okay. Um, I mean, it's a thing that happened. There's no reason that, to ignore it. I don't know. I don't like to. He's a yeah. Okay, well, if you want to bring that up, I want to bring up one positive thing. That, uh, there Do was, it. There was uh, a boy who was... There was a screening of this movie for uh, children to get to meet the cast and whatnot. And there was an autistic child who wrote to David Bowie because he okay. wanted to see it, but he didn't do well in crowds. So David Bowie uh, personally met with him, and he also sent him a letter with a package filled with nothing, and he said he sent him an invisible mask that... He wore every day because he was also terrified to be around people, but he wore it and it protected him from people. And now when the kid wore it, he would wore it himself. And oh, that's actually maybe kind of clever. Yeah. 
interestingly enough, that story itself kind of plays on the themes and ideas of Labyrinth better than the actual fucking movie does, yeah. where the boy uses fantasy and play in identity formulation to actually protect himself and deal with real world problems. David Bowie in his letter to a fan made a better story than actually Labyrinth. And I think that pretty much sums it up all together. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting note to end on. Hashtag thick Ludo. <laughs> So this has been the Spectator Film Podcast. You can find us at spectatorfilmpodcast.com where we are on Stitcher, iTunes, and Spotify, and uh, the radio. Um, the AM radio. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you can find us. Well, don't find us physically. We're not going to tell you. <laughs> Please find us. Uh, <laughs> where are we? We don't know. Anyway, so this has been the show. So I guess it's over. Bye. Bye.